Meaningful Show podcast, episode number 56, interview with Lyle McDonald. Today's episode of The Meaningful Show is brought to you by Flashnotes Book Summaries over at GetFlashnotes.com, where you can get nonfiction book summaries on best-selling business and personal development books that you can read or listen to in under 20 minutes. Now, here's the cool thing about Flashnotes. They're literally designed for action. Think about it. Why do you read? To enhance your life, right? Either personally or professionally. Let me ask you another question. Does your life get better when you learn a new piece of information from a book you've just read? Or does it get better when you take action on the new piece of information from the book that you just read? Now, that's where flash notes come in so handy because they're only 20 minutes. You can read them or you can listen to them while you're driving to work or doing something else. And all they do is give you the extracted actionable insights from these books. So again, come on over to getflashnotes.com. You can get started for a dollar. Again, that's one dollar. You can get started, give it a shot, download them. They come in many different formats for iPhones, iPads, Kindles, PDF format, audio, MP3 format. So whichever style or whichever format that you prefer to consume the content in, whether that's Apple, Android, or whatever, you can get those insights you can get those flash notes book summaries delivered straight to your brain and you can do it quickly so you can immediately degenerate that information into action to enhance your life welcome to the meaningful show podcast where every single week we work to bring you an inspiring insight idea or interview to help you live better work better and be better both in life and in business brought to you by meaningfulhq.com we've got one very simple goal here on this show and that is to help you do more of what matters and less of what doesn't i'm your host dean bakari and if you're ready then i'm ready so let's get into it Hey, what's up? It's Dean Bakari coming back at you with another episode of the Meaningful Show podcast. Today, I have a guest by the name of Lyle McDonald here on the show. Now, Lyle is an author of several, several different health and fitness books, and he maintains an incredibly popular website, bodyrecomposition.com. And the thing that makes his work so interesting and the reason why I've asked him to come on the show today is because he does something that, unfortunately enough, way too many people in the fitness world don't do, and that's the basing of their work on science-driven, fact-based information. And I think that his ability to put this type of research-driven work out on a consistent basis is why he's been around for so long. Um, I found out about him, I think it was, if I remember correctly, on um, Martin... Berkin's website, Lean Gains, when I first got into intermittent fasting several, several years ago. And um, I think he referred him, uh, his work, sort of as like a, uh, uh, like, a, a, like a reference or a source or something on, on intermittent fasting. But in any case, Lyle, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Dean. Glad to be here. So if you could tell us a little bit about um, yourself and how you got into health and fitness in the first place. Um, I sort of fell into it. I grew up uh, in sort of a typical middle class neighborhood. Both my parents were musicians, not really athletic growing up um, or into sports and a lot of typical, you know, white bread, bologna and cheese sandwiches. Um, probably uh, 15, 16 years old, I got involved in cycling and my high school actually had mandatory sports. So that kind of got me involved obliquely in athletics. Um, I still wasn't particularly good at it, but I did sort of get interested in it. That would eventually lead me to go to UCLA to study um, exercise physiology, and there I got interested in um, inline skating, which this was 88, 89, so right when that, that first fad was taking off and got into racing, and since I was already in the program, you know, I read all the magazines and saw all the ads and got very interested in a lot of the science behind performance, supplementation, uh, dieting, all that sort of stuff. It was sort of a way to, you know... I wanted to be a better athlete than I was, so mm. I got involved in what was going on. A lot of it was also there's so many claims in those advertisements, and my exercise physiology professor would constantly point out how most of them were nonsense. So I sort yeah. of went to the, uh, the original uh, source. So that took me, you know, out of college, 1993, 
And then in the uh, mid to late 90s, there was a very infamous book by a very infamous individual named Dan Duchesne and Body Opus, which was a, a cyclical ketogenic diet. So it alternated five days of low carbohydrates and a weekend carb load, and I got very interested in that. That led to my first book, and it sort of all came out of there um, and has been the last, you know, I'm going to say, what was that, 17, 18 years pretty much pursuing this one thing. So that's kind of the, the brief version. Wow. And so you right now you're, you've just released, I think it's an update to one of your books, The Stubborn kind, Fat Loss Solution. Kind of. So I, I wrote a book in, I think it was 2008, called The Stubborn Fat Solution. And it, it was the culmination of about a decade's worth of, of interest. You know, this issue, men typically have some stubborn fat areas, lower abdominals, lower back. Women's hips and thighs have always been very difficult. So I spent about 10 years just kind of thinking about that and researching it. And, and I wrote this book, and in it I mentioned this new fat burning pathway and it was this hormone that they just found worked outside of the normal pathways and I kind of wrote about it uh, in passing because there wasn't much I could do with it. It was called atrial natriuretic peptide. It's actually released from the heart and just works in fat cells very differently. And That's interesting. Just to interject and stop you there. Yeah. So it's like, so a hormone being released from the heart? Uh, yeah, I mean, that what, what's really coming I think out of the science now uh, is that in the body, like everything affects everything. You know, mm -hmm. your fat cells talk to your brain, your heart talks to your brain, your heart talks to the fat cells. And this was kind of an accidental discovery on their part. Um, Atronatriuretic peptide is mainly involved in water balance, blood pressure, and, and what they had seen is that it goes up when people are suffering from high blood pressure. And they typically use certain drugs in those individuals that, that tend to block uh, fat mobilization. And then they saw that these folks were still um, getting fat out of fat cells, which led them to kind of pursue this pathway. And they found that, aha, this atrial natriuretic peptide was a whole new pathway. I mean, when I say new, for probably the last 80 years, the only two major hormones were insulin and uh, the catecholamines, adrenaline and noradrenaline. Mm -hmm. So for 2000 to discover an entirely new pathway was kind of a novel thing and you know the the kind of the thought process behind it you often see a lot of things happening when people have high blood pressure start to get obese or gain weight that the body sort of tries to fight it off so right. a lot of these adaptations are at least an attempt to get things back to normal but they tend not to work because we're in an environment that sort of overwhelms them so the the thinking is that well you know it it tries to get the body to drop water. It actually goes to the brain and helps control hunger and appetite. You know, typically high blood pressure and inactivity and obesity often go hand in hand. So I think the idea is that, ah, oh, it may be helping to, uh, it, it's sort of an attempt to get body fat and body weight back down. It just sort of doesn't work. So, so anyway, I wrote about this in 2008 originally and didn't really have any way to manipulate it. Um, some of the weird stuff they'd done was, uh, use a tilt table, which is something that they use medically where they kind of put you on a board and then tilt you so your head's below your the rest of your body and this jacks blood pressure and there's some indication that exercise did it and water exercise maybe, but so I just wrote about this kind of, oh, this is interesting, can't do anything with it, and then found a, a, a drug method of manipulating it and I actually started this little project in probably 2008 and then just, don't know why, I just lost interest. I, I just sort of forgot about it. Recently, I started a new project and started looking back into the research and found that atrial natriuretic peptide may have a bunch of other potential benefits. It may activate something called um, beige fat, which is the new version of brown fat that burns off calories in the body, um, mm. helps with appetite. Like This research just wasn't around in 2008, so I'm kind of glad that my laziness took hold. <laughs> so, so sort of the, the update focuses on this atrial natriuretic peptide, what it does, and then it's a, a very much, it's a drug-based manipulation, which I know a lot of people, you know, don't want to go that route, um, which is part of why I didn't just update the original book. I found that um, people that want drug solutions only want drug solutions, and people that don't get very put off when you talk about them. Right. So I found that it usually is better to keep those things um, separate. Se separate, yeah, very much so. So if somebody did want to go that route or was like thinking about it, what's a safe way to do it with that? And I also want to talk about like ephedrine and all those things if, if we could after this. Well, I'm going to be cagey here just because, you know, the, the punchline is sort of in the book and it's a very... Uh, 
counterintuitive um, approach because the, the drug in question, like by itself, should actually hurt fat loss. But I actually proposed oh, using wow. it with other thermogenics, with ephedrine, clenbuterol. Um, I kind of I produced uh, or presented a bunch of different stacks that ranged from fairly mild to fairly insane just because I knew people would be interested in it. Um, so, yeah, this is one of those things that I'd rather just, you know, go buy the book. Um, it's only 12 bucks out of my store. So, um, and I finally made it available. I figured out how to do Kindle and um, EPUB type books. So, I'm finally caught up with 2000. 2015. Um, I personally like real books, but I know, or physical books, but I know a lot of people. Most people these days don't. So I've I've started to look into doing the digital formats and Kindle stuff. So yeah, a lot of people, uh, a lot of people like. It. I'm 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 the same way as you are with that. Like I love uh, you know physical books because I'm the kind of guy that likes to take notes in them, highlight them, dog ear the pages, come back to them. You know. Yeah, I just I'm finding the majority either because it's a space issue or they're on the run all the time. Yeah. Uh, Really prefer since I actually started re uh, reselling ebooks in my store a few years ago. It's about ninety percent ebooks. Like it really has the 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 book reading trends have really changed, um, and and certainly the people that want physical books has gone down enormously. So cause then you can you know from a space perspective you can store how many hundreds or whatever of books on a Kindle. If you don't have a lot of bookshelf space, that doesn't work. So um, it also lets people read them when they're, you know, on the train, at work, killing time without having to carry a book around with them. So Yeah, for sure. And a lot of people, like, they'll, like, I'll, I'll, I've got hundreds and hundreds in my Kindle. And then I'll yeah. order, like, uh, if I really like a book on Kindle, I'll actually order the physical book. <laughs> yeah. yeah, which is another, which is a really good way of doing it. Yeah. Sort of check it out because it's usually cheaper and easier and faster. And then if you like it, you can, you know, can get that. I, I think a lot of people probably download stuff that they're never going to read. Uh, it's kind of like the steam store. It's like, Oh, for $3, I can't not get this. And then they kind of get around to actually reading it. So or playing it. Kind of puppy. So, um, all right, let's talk, let's talk about like a, a, uh, one of these things. Again, I want to get back to just this topic yeah. of, the, the topic that a lot of people are afraid to talk about, the topic of, you know, you mentioned clenbuterol and ephedrine and things like that. And some people will either, you know, the two extremes, they'll either shy away from it completely, never go near it, or right. they'll go overboard and, you know, make themselves, put themselves in a very, very bad health situation. Sure. Um, I mean, I'm not very experienced with it, but I have tried ephedrine. Yeah. Um, and I found it incredibly useful, but then again, of course, people like <laughs> they'll they'll go overboard, right? Yeah. Um, this, so this what are, all... what are what are your recommendations for people uh, in that in that regard? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it, you know, I've been involved in sort of the athletic and at least tangentially bodybuilding subculture, and they're usually the ones bodybuilders, especially they'll they'll try anything. They're <laughs> they're usually the guinea pig. <laughs> They were the ones that first jumped on clenbuterol back in the '90s. When it, so, what know. is clenbuterol, by the way? Because we have a lot, oh. we have a broad range of listeners from you know people yeah. who never work out to people who obsessively work out sure. to okay. people in the middle. You know what I mean? So, what is clenbuterol? Okay, so let's go back to ephedrine. So, ephedrine is what's technically called a sympathomimetic, which just means that it mimics you know the sympathetic nervous system response, right? The fight or flight response. So, right. you get scared, something's chasing you, even when you exercise, and certain hormones go. In your body, they increase energy production, they raise heart and blood pressure, and among other things, they mobilize fat for fuel. Ephedrine mimics that. Um, and when it's combined with caffeine, it does so even more. It actually causes the body to release those hormones. It probably binds to the receptors that, that have some of those effects. So it tends to, you know, raise heart rate and blood pressure, increase metabolism by 5%, and mobilizes fat for fuel. Um, often blunts hunger for a lot of people and you know there were 20 years worth of research showing that it was enormously beneficial safe if used intelligently and then the nature of the weight loss world is if some is good more is better right if, if, <laughs> if one dose if the standard dose raises metabolism by five percent well then I should take triple the dose and get three times the effect Let's and take 300 milligrams yeah exactly and the problem then is that um, unfortunately you know frequently there are already issues you know with heart rate and blood pressure in in overweight individuals so you, you right. almost see this effect where the people that could most benefit from it are really the ones that shouldn't be using it at least not uh, without 
a good bit of care. Right, um, there was right. also an issue where they started sneaking it into products like some of the early, you know, herbal ecstasy and, and stuff like that. And people end up getting more than they think they're taking. There were a handful of very uh, vocal deaths that happened and everyone kind of freaked out. But, you know, the 20 years of research says, ah, if you use it correctly, it's perfectly safe. Uh, The benefits, usually the side effects go away after a few weeks. The benefits seem to get actually increase over time, which is unusual. Um, But again, people kind of went nuts. Uh, There was also the issue that ephedrine is used to make meth. And that was a big part of the reason that um, it either got pulled or with some of the pharmaceutical products, they added a, a compound called guafenicin, which is makes you cough. And, and mainly they did that so the folks couldn't buy it and make meth. Um, uh-huh. here, in, here in Texas, you actually are limited to how many grams per day and per month you can buy. Uh, you have to swipe a driver's license. The feds keep track of it because they assume that if you're buying much more than that, that you're probably running a meth lab. Okay, yeah, so that's, that's how it is in California as well. Yeah, you yeah. sign a little thing, you, you show your exactly. ID, swipe it, all that. Exactly. Okay, so clenbuterol is kind of a more, it's very similar in nature. Um, it's a little bit more focused and that, without getting into too many details, it, it sort of targets uh, the beneficial receptors in terms of mobilizing fat, increasing metabolic rate, but it has far less side effects. And it was originally used in animals, you know, farmers and, and people that Horses raise animals. Stuff, right? Yeah, they're always looking for ways to decrease fat and increase muscle mass without having to really change their diet. It's called feed efficiency. It's, just, it's a money thing. Mm. So studies came out that clenbuterol had these just amazing effects, just stripped body fat, increased muscle mass. So, of course, the athletes and bodybuilders jumped on it. Mm. And it and it does work. I mean, Clen is extremely effective. Um, I mean, I've seen fr- you know friends uh, in the bodybuilding industry and just you know just oh, yeah. regular old gym rats. I mean, you you don't see them for a few weeks, and then all of a sudden you run into them, and I'm like, God damn, dude, you just got yeah. to- you you're yeah. shredded. What happened? It's, it's an enormous effect. The problem with Clen is that it stops working in about two or three weeks. This was kind of the difficulty that folks ran into because it is so much more in terms of how it hits the receptors. It's so much more potent. There were ways that, to get around that. You know, people started stacking it with thyroid medication. Um, it, it looks like. Uh, and well, if, his, you, if you stack it with like a thyroid medication, doesn't that shut down? Uh, well, I, and and you tell me, you know, I'm asking. Like, doesn't it shut it, down your ability to produce? Those? A lot of it depends on on dose. Uh, at small doses, thyroid is not really an enormous problem, and it doesn't have a huge effect. But again, people fall into this "more is better" kind of mentality. Right. So right. to put it in perspective, you know, 25 micrograms of thyroid medication is basically a full replacement dose. So that would that would replace every bit of thyroid you have in your body. Yeah. Bodybuilders may take between four and ten times that much. <laughs> <laughs> They've got other stuff going on, but. I mean, this is, and and of course, you know, they try to use thyroid medication back in the day for weight loss. Thyroid by itself tends to cause muscle loss. It causes heart palpitations, heart rate, blood pressure go up, can cause thyroid storm in rare cases. So, you know, that's something that most people probably shouldn't, but in low doses, it's fine. The problem is people go, oh, 25 micrograms is good. Hmm. Well, (laughs) 75 micrograms is better. And, you know, and again, usually the folks that are using these compounds are lean, are active, don't tend to have those same problems that you tend that you frequently see, you know, in people that are overweight and inactive. So so kind of the people that could most benefit from this stuff, the ones that probably shouldn't be taking it, at least not initially. Mm. Um, so, you know, Clen was also, it's, it's not, it, it, they want, no doctor would prescribe it for you for the most part. You know, it has to be ordered from overseas or out of the country. And I think a lot of the reason that a lot that people get very sketchy about those kind of drugs, you know, legal issues, things of that nature. Um, you know, in America, we have a very schizophrenic attitude towards drugs and always have, you know, people will take caffeine, smoke and drink every day. <laughs> And then they will tell you that anabolic steroids are evil. And there's sort of this mentality that, you know, and just people drawing arbitrary lines in the sand. It's them justifying what they do. And, you know, I, right. I once had a girl, a, friend, a girl that I knew who was a chain smoker, did cocaine and drank, who once told me, I don't think protein bars are healthy for you. <laughs> I see the same sort of thing with drugs. 
nobody will blink if a pianist takes a beta blocker to make themselves calmer for a performance or if someone takes that drug before a presentation. But if an athlete uses it, suddenly it's cheating. And it's just this kind of very weird uh, schizophrenic. The social stigma is just totally. It's, 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 it, it is, and, and and certainly with weight loss, you know, it comes out of this very puritanical attitude that for some reason it's okay to wake up with caffeine, but if you want to lose weight or change your body, by yeah, God, if it doesn't just come down to willpower and hard work, you're lazy. It's it's you're a, a really yeah, and a cheater, and it's just it's the same thing with athletes, and it's just these weird arbitrary lines in the sand. Um, you know, there's also been a problem since these things frequently other countries aren't regulated well. You know, often you get problems with contaminants. You know, back in the '80s, guys were mixing up liquid clenbuterol in their bathtubs, and the reality is that's not going to be pure. And so people often get into problems because what they're getting isn't. Uh, a pure compound. Frequently, people will sell stuff that's not actually what they tell you they're selling. Mm. Uh, and this tends to happen really at the extremes of the bodybuilding world, where somebody is selling growth hormone, or say they are, which is unbearably expensive, but they've packed something else in that bottle. And you get guys using stuff that they think is something else, and that's really a quick way to get yourself into trouble. Right. So I think I think it's a lot of those factors. It's just this weird mentality, this weird American mentality that using drugs for certain things is okay. Nobody would blink if you told them you were going to take an antihistamine because you're stuffed up. But God forbid you take something to block your appetite because you're having trouble losing weight. Then it's cheating. It's it's very it's very, it's very confusing. Um, so yeah, it's 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 interesting. It's interesting because. Most of the drugs that are regulated by by these big pharmaceutical companies are the ones that are the most dangerous for you in the first place. Free, yeah, frequently that's the case. It's just they've gone through that FDA approval process, which is often completely bizarre, absolutely arbitrary. You know, it's been pointed out that if you tried to get aspirin through FDA approval right now, you probably couldn't because it's got such a general mechanism of effect. It's really hard, you know, what it's actually doing in the body because it does so many different things. Mm -hmm. You know, the FDA wants to see these very specific things for compounds. And there's also an issue with a lot of these older drugs. If they can't be patented, nobody cares. Um, right. Right. Actually, a buddy of mine just last night. And, okay, so there's another compound we might as well touch on called DNP, which is dinotrophenol. Mm -hmm. DNP is probably one of the two most, potentially most dangerous compounds that anyone could ever use. Um, what it does is it, it blocks the body's ability to make energy in the mitochondria, so the body just burns off fat and glucose like crazy and throws off heat. And depending on the dose, it can raise metabolism by 10 to 50% per day, right? Whoa. So somebody that, you know, it's enormous. Like somebody that, that has a 2,000 calorie energy expenditure, they could burn 3,000 calories a day. Dude, you know what? Just, uh, just saying this, I've actually, I remember reading about this a long, long time ago. So DNP first came, was actually discovered by accident back in like the 20s because, you know, nobody used gloves or, or safety procedures and they found that all these uh, factory workers working on uh, TNT, which mm. uh, using this Dynamite. compound, <laughs> would, uh, lose weight, turn orange, and then die. And uh, basically in that order. And so they started looking at it and found that, that DNP did this. And they actually use it now to study yeast metabolism because it, it, it mitochondrial function. And um, so for a while, in the 20s and 30s, it was used as a weight loss compound. And again, the problem was that used at appropriate doses, it was super effective. But nothing was labeled, nothing was regulated, and they started putting it in everything. Hmm. And people were getting far more than they thought they were because people just put it in every, every diet product that, of course, everyone was taking. There was a small increase in the number of cataracts, and actually that was part of what caused the FDA to get... Um, Cataract? So it was giving people cataract? There's, tiny, there's just a tiny percentage of people that, that picked up cataract because it, it affects cellular metabolism to such a degree. But even there, it, the, the incidence of cataracts in DNP users I don't think was any higher than in the general population. But between that and the fact that people were getting into problems, uh, the FDA was created and pulled the stuff. 
Mm. So it kind of disappeared for a while, and then it popped up in bodybuilding, I think, in the 70s and 80s, and then disappeared again. And then Dan Duchesne uh, ran into a guy who was using it in weight loss clinics, and he was actually giving DNP plus thyroid um, to his, his weight loss people with great, great effect. Um, there's actually a cool paper looking at this, and DNP is safer and more effective than thyroid medication because it doesn't raise heart rate or blood pressure or any of that stuff. The problem is it makes you very, very warm because um, you're throwing off all this heat. Like It feels like you're running a low-grade fever, which is very, it's very an odd feeling. Also, if you overdose, you will die. <laughs> actually don't, and I don't mean that as a scare tactic, and I don't mean that hyperbolically. Most drugs, if you take them, the more you take, right, you hit sort of a, you sort of top out with the side effects. Like a right. veteran just keep raising your metabolism and raising your metabolism. DMP has no limit like that. So, so it'll just raise your body's internal temperature uh, and, and then you'll just drop dead. And it, and it stays in the body about 24 hours. So if you have a single overdose, you just got there's nothing you can do because you can't clear it. You can't stop it. The, the only treatment is you go to the hospital, they put you in an ice bath and then give you an ice water enema and attempt to bring your core temperature back down. And basically you will cook your brain. You will go up to over 102, 105 degrees and just like an enormous fever, it will cook your brain. And if you don't die, you still are probably going to have brain damage. Um, Dear you Lord. said low dose, and, and, and that's sort of that. That's a really enormous issue. There was also a problem that, you know, the potentially lethal dose and the you know the original recommended dose weren't that far apart. So you get someone who really falls into that more is better standpoint, and you get into some real real problems. Mm -hmm. um, the the current approach to DMP use is actually much lower doses for long periods because you, you're just miserable. Like. People that use it in the middle of winter mm -hmm. are still just sweating like you couldn't believe because it's 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 such at high doses it just makes you feel awful. At low doses, you know, you still get a good 10-15% boost, but you don't get the massive side effects. That's What's interesting, crazy. this goes back to, to sort of an earlier topic, right? There's a study just came out on um on is either rats or mice, and they found that aha, a long-lasting DNP decreased fatty liver, diabetes, body fat, all this other stuff. Like all of a sudden, DNP has now been legitimized because scientific research shows. However, I was talking to a buddy of mine who, who his wife is actually involved in a pharmaceutical company. Mm -hmm. Given that DNP stays in your system for like 24 hours. So why would you make it time release, right? There's absolutely no reason to do it that way, except for this. A pharmaceutical company cannot patent DNP. However, they can patent a time release form. Is it because they can they not patent it because it's a it's, it's so a naturally it's, it's, it's so well, it's, old. It's a, it's a sixty year old compound. You know, all, all drugs, whether they're oh, so it's kind of like a book that's in the public archives. Then yeah, but even drugs now, once they've been out for seven years, you can make a generic, and that's part and part of that is so that the drug companies can make their money back. But once a compound has been around for so long, you just that's why you can't patent vitamin C. It's naturally occurring. You know, if you came up with some magical form of vitamin C. Uh, you That'd could take it. Uh, we might actually uh, touch on this, but I, there's actually something that I'm taking, and it's basically a high-dose methylfolate supplement, which is a form of folic acid. Mm. It is, I don't know if it's patented, but it's pre prescription only, which is very unusual for what is ultimately a vitamin supplement, and somehow they, that worked. Um, but So yeah, this new company has made a time-release DNP so that they can patent it, and it'll be really interesting to see if this supposedly deadly compound is suddenly used uh, therapeutically because it's now been legitimized. Yeah, that'd be hilarious to see yeah, commercials yeah. with... Uh... <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes, exactly. And, you know, it, we'll see if it gets past the animal research, but it is really interesting. Oh, you know, it's and it's actually funny going back to the steroid thing. Um, you know, anabolic steroids, if you ask most people or most doctors, ah, they're horrible, they'll kill you, liver failure, all this other stuff, it's just not true. When I used to go to the, the biomedical library and I would read, you know, looking at journals that were dealing with, you know, wasting or HIV or things like that, you will see advertisements for anabolic steroids that yeah, are being just testosterone replacement therapy and all those. Well, good that was even this is even before that. This was being prescribed to prevent wasting in AIDS, cancer, a lot oh, of those that's diseases. Right. Yeah where anabolic steroids have enormous beneficial effects. And it's like, okay, so explain this to me. Why is it legitimate 
when it's used in a prescription form for a medical use, and yet somehow it's going to kill athletes. This doesn't make, I mean, I realize a lot of it, there's, there's a dose effect. Athletes tend to go crazy. But again, it, it sort of points out this really bizarre schizophrenia that comes to drugs. It's like, ah, if a doctor gives you a drug, it's okay. It's all, but if you take it on your own, you're cheating. Right. It's kind of like this weird, it's like, well, and I've heard people make this argument. Well, why are steroids bad? Well, because they're illegal. Well, why are they illegal? Well, because they're bad. Okay, um, that's a circular argument, and what that means is, you know, marijuana is a good example. It'll be interesting to see 10 years from now, or however long it takes for the entire country to legalize marijuana, because it's going to happen. Texas will be the last state, in my opinion, but it's already started. When that happens, will the public perception suddenly switch from, oh my God, the evil, you know, reef or whatever, to, well, it's legal now, ergo it's good. Right. I'm really be interested to see how that plays out. If people that use the, well, it's bad because it's illegal logic, who would tell you right now that marijuana is dangerous and bad and blah, 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 if that will change when suddenly it's legitimized and sold over the counter. Yeah, right. I think that at the end of the day, if the media perpetuates it in a positive light, and this sure. is with any, dis any discussion, any topic, uh, just simply because most people uh, prefer to just sit there in front of the television and get their information rather than, you know, look into it, actually ask questions um, and, and do their own reading. Um, I agree. They'll, you know, shift the total, you know, the, the, the entire society's beliefs and, and you know, uh, perspective on that topic. Yeah, topic. I, I agree completely. And, you know, it's, it's like so many things. You know, I'm, I'm a dog advocate. I have a pit bull who's like he's relentlessly friendly. And it's the same thing. What you typically hear on the news because it generates uh, traffic and interest is you always hear about the bad stuff. You always hear about the one guy who died from this. And what you don't hear about is the 99.9% .9 that didn't. Like even if you looked at the ephedrine, the handful of ephedrine deaths, Invariably, there was something else going on, usually alcohol, other recreational drugs, mm. and it was, you know, one-tenth of one percent of the total number of people that were using it. And as you brought up, pharmaceuticals kill more people every, aspirin kills more people every single year from ulcers and an uncle who, you know, read that, oh, aspirin helps prevent heart attacks. So he took three full aspirins a day and oh gave himself an ulcer, right, because more is better. If 81 milligrams is good, 900 milligrams <laughs> is better. And but you don't hear about that sort of thing. What you hear about is ah, the single drug issue or whatever it is. Yeah. And you know, there's still not a single death that can be attributed to anabolic steroids per se. Diuretics, sure. Insulin, absolutely. DNP, oh yeah. Anabolic <laughs> steroids, absolutely not. But whenever some whenever there is a problem, that's what you hear about. And it's yeah. that one. And again, there's usually something else going on, like you said. That's what you know, same thing. You hear about the one dog that attacked somebody, which is sometimes a pit bull and often is not. It is a dog that is not a pit bull, but is called a pit bull. And people are like, yep, the breed should be destroyed. It's like, right, why don't you show the thousands of dogs? Why don't you point out the fact that pit bulls used to be nanny dogs and were used to watch children before the crazies and turn them into fighting dogs? But yeah, know, that's an interesting thing. Like, I have a neighbor, one of my old neighbors, actually. We just moved, but he, he had a pit bull and... You know, when I first saw saw him walking the pit bull in the neighborhood, you know, I had the same same perspective that most people do about pit bulls, which is holy shit, back away, this dog's gonna bite your face off. Yep. And then, you know, I, I'm the kind of guy that likes to say hello to people when I'm walking by and stuff like that. And uh, you know, one day eventually, I just started talking to the guy, and we're talking about his pit bull, and he's like, oh, don't worry, man, don't be scared, don't be afraid. This whole thing that people think about pit bulls is 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 totally you know it's not that way. He's he's the nicest dog, and you know eventually after getting to know him, his dog's name was Spirit, nicest dog on the planet, mm -hmm. um, very very soft, very very nice, looks scary as hell. But yes. um, I learned a lot about that just from him him talking to me about you know. It how. was funny. My mom came to visit and had never met my dog and you know had the same mental attitude and basically all my dog wanted to do was cuddle and lick her face and it really you know and to make no mistake you know pit bulls can't you know 
it's more the people training them, and there's actually uh, some good reasons that the that the fighting dog people picked on picked pit bulls to train, and it's because pit bulls were bred originally to never turn on their owner. This was mm. a, a behavior that you know most dogs like if they're fighting, if you reach in, you will become the target, and they will bite the hell out of you. Right. Pit bulls won't do that, so they may, in addition to being physically impressive and having jaws that make no mistake can crush you know rock. If you're training them to fight and you need to pull the dogs apart, they won't bite you. And that's what made them kind of a perfect, but it's also what made them, you know, great as, like I said, for watching kids. They will never turn on their owner. And, but it made, you know, so they got picked up for that. And, you know, what statistically, other dogs actually bite people more frequently. Like little yappy dogs, little, there are other dogs <laughs> have a higher incidence of, of biting. Pers- the problem is they don't do the damage, right? right? right. It's kind of like the example of, yeah, people fear airplane crashes way more than car crashes, right? You're, the likelihood right, yeah. of airplane crashing is minuscule. The difference is you usually don't walk away from it. Mm-hmm. You know, certainly, if a pit bull bites you, you're going to have a bad time. <laughs> you're not going to walk away from it. <laughs> yeah, something bad is going to happen. Whereas if, you know, but littler dogs are way, you know, I think have a higher, I, I'd have to look to be sure, don't swear me to that. But they bite just as often. It's just they don't tend to rip people's faces off when it happens. Right. So that, you know, it, it's, it, it is that public perception thing. You hear about the small percentage of problems. You never hear about the good stuff. And especially now, I mean, People have gotten to the point that any dog that even is, is even remotely kind of built like a pit bull will be called a pit bull in the media. There's such a negative aspect of it that all the all the breeds that are even close close appearance wise, somebody gets bitten, ah, another pit bull went nuts. Like it's just. I remember years ago, and I don't know if this is still the, the case in California. Are ferrets still? Uh, outlawed in California? They were years ago. Um, I have no idea. This, this was back when I was in college. I actually went to UCLA, and at one point, ferrets, like you could have a pit bull, but you could have a ferret. Huh. And the story that was at least going around was it's because ferrets were, were dangerous, which I don't think, I think it had something to do with, there's a brown ferret population that got put, but whatever, like there was kind of this idea that, ah, ferrets are dangerous because they'll bite you. And it's like, that's hilarious. Yeah, okay. But anyway, um, so yeah, um, back, <laughs> certainly drugs, t- there's not only this weird schizophrenic attitude, but they tend to be presented in such a way that everyone just kind of loses their mind. And, um, and yeah, they are certainly informed by that. Um, a couple more quick questions about this yeah. while we're just talking about sure. drugs um, and hormones and things of that nature. I recently read that vitamin D is more of a hormone than than uh, a supplement. Do you know anything yeah, about that? It, yeah, it does. Like, their, vitamin D is turning out, like, to do, I don't know, everything. It's another one of those compounds that, you know, if you haven't seen the research, it sounds almost too good to be true. Right. But it does, you know, there are vitamin D receptors in skeletal muscle and stuff like that, and it, it, it appears to be having some hormone-like effects. Mm-hmm. Vitamin D is also kind of odd in that, you know, the body can technically make it, right? Sun exposure to the skin, your skin actually makes vitamin D. Right. It has all these effects. Um, They're just, you know, enormous. They appear to have effect on skeletal muscle. Um, It's sort of interesting that, you know, the Germans, who are always very insane about this stuff, did a bunch of science back in the 30s, and they found that their athletes didn't make as many strength gains in the winter. And, you know, nobody knew really anything back then, but they thought, oh, well, there's something to, you know, ultraviolet light exposure that may play a role. Mm -hmm. They busted out the ultraviolet lights. Suddenly their athletes made the same gains as the summer, and it's now probably thought that vitamin D was a big part of that. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, certainly athletes that get to train year-round in the sun, there are other benefits, but, you know, there seems to be certainly uh, an effect going on, and some of it's general health, some of it's immune system, some of it, it does, I, yeah, it does seem to have some hormone-like effects, certainly impact on skeletal muscle, and it's something that almost everybody is deficient in. Um, Especially these days when most people are just sitting on their chairs, not going outside, not exposing themselves to the sun. Well, this is something that kind of came up, right, is, you know, we, we see these jumps from extreme to extreme. So in the 70s, Everybody got psychotic and crazy about having a, a healthy tan, and they started <laughs> playing out 14 hours a week and all this craziness. Right. And, and of course, we saw this big increase in melanoma and skin cancer. 
and suddenly it was like, oh my God, you have to cover up and use S SPF 200, and if you, you know, and, and we went to the other extreme. Suddenly right. they didn't realize that the problem wasn't sun exposure. The problem was too much sun exposure. The problem mm -hmm. is, you know, and all that kind of stuff. So we went and cu coupled that with everybody works indoors. A lot of people work, you know, they go to work in the dark, they come home in the dark, we don't go outside, we watch television. There are certain uh, areas of the world, you know, go to the UK, Ireland, Canada, that at least several months out of the year, they just don't get sunlight. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting that, you know, back in the day, if you lived in, in England or the UK and had the money for it, they took what, you know, they took these two-week you know, energizing vacations, and they would go somewhere sunny. And again, I don't think nobody knew what was going on. They just knew that two weeks of being in the sun made them feel better. Right. And I'm, I'm reasonably sure among other things, not the least of which being not having UK food, um, which is awful, that getting, you know, a couple weeks to, to bump up uh, vitamin D levels is probably a big part of that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another topic that is, is like super, super popular right now is this topic of nootropics. Yeah. Um, do you have anything like, I'll be honest, it's not, I haven't, you know, back when I was in college, it was kind of the first wave of that stuff. And I remember when everyone got big on vasopressin and dimethyl, DMAE, dimethylaminoethanol and a bunch of, and I, I played around with them at that time. And then there's a sort of, you know, most of the work tends to be in people that have sort of neurological dysfunction. And I'm not convinced it has enormous benefits for most people, but Again, I'm not really that up on it to have a, a well-informed opinion. Um, I know a lot of people like them. I know there's some, probably some more targeted stuff coming out mm -hmm. as far as focusing. But again, I can't, I can't honestly say that I'm up on it enough to, to say one way or the other. Cool. So let's talk about diet. Let's talk about okay. um, yeah. you know eating, eating regimens and things of that nature if we could. So yeah, absolutely. first thing I want to ask you about is, I mean, you've written extensively about uh, the ketogenic diet. Yeah. Um, so there's, you know, obviously two camps on this. There's the, there's the camp that loves it, and then there's the camp that absolutely, you know, hates it. Um, yeah. And then, of course, there's the folks who don't know much about it and are just curious. So if you could speak to that camp, the, the curious yeah. camp. <laughs> All right. So, so ketogenic diet is kind of a, a general term for, you know, a, any low-carbohydrate diet. Where the carbs are below about 100 grams a day will be ketogenic. So what does that mean? Uh, Less than 100 it, carbs per day. Yeah, that's you're going to be in your body, you're going to put your body in keto. Is that yeah, and something called ketosis. And all that means is that the body is breaking down fat and making what are called ketone bodies. Mm -hmm. which are a couple different ones. And ketones are basically just another type of fuel. And and they're interesting in that they can actually be used by the brain for fuel. Fatty acids can't. Fatty acids can't cross the blood-brain barrier, can't get into the brain. So ketones are thought to be sort of an alternative fuel source when you're fasting or starving, right? Mm -hmm. Brain typically uses a lot of glucose for fuel, a lot of carbohydrate. If you're starving, if you don't have any food, and the body were to keep using that much carbohydrate, it has to get it from somewhere. So it breaks down muscle, it breaks down organs, and you die very, very quickly. So presumably the body came up with this alternate pathway to use fat-derived fuel to keep you alive longer. Which is essentially just another way of it protecting itself, right? Yeah, oh yeah, exactly. There's lots of adaptations like that. So diets have come and gone that sort of utilize this effect. You know, one of the earliest diets was the Banting diet in the early 20th, late Mm, I'm sorry, late 19th century, I think, which is one of the first low-carb diets. Mm -hmm. um, it kind of went in and out of popularity. And then probably the, the one most people know about is the Atkins diet. And this really took the world by storm in the 70s and was really one of the first, you know, quote-unquote fad low-carbohydrate diets. And, you know, certainly it worked while people were on it. And then it stopped working after when they stopped going on it, you know, in the 80s. Everyone decided that fat was bad, and we went into sort of the hot, low fat phase, and then we kind of swung through the zone and something in the middle, and then protein powder power came out by the eads, and you know it, it, the diet stuff tends to kind of come in cycles based on where people are at. So you know, to your point, you know, on the, on the one side, you've got the people who are like, ah. Ketogenic diets are better than sucks and sunshine, the best thing ever. That's actually that's an actual quote. And then you, you know the classical dietitians who are like, ah, ketosis is dangerous. 
Um, one of the truly dumbest things I've ever read was a dietitian who, you know, because one of the ketone bodies is acetone. Uh -huh. And keep in mind that these pathways, these biochemical pathways evolved tens of thousands or however many years ago, right? The body mm -hmm. does it for a reason. And she said, acetone is the same thing as in uh, fingernail polish remover and why would you want that? She doesn't realize <laughs> she does it completely backwards, right? The body makes acetone and it does it for a reason. Mm -hmm. This comparison to fingernail polish, this was before the food babe and I do not want to talk about her, but that's just food, food babe level stupid, right? The body just generally does not make things that it are going to do it a lot of harm. Um, one other mis misconception, uh, insulin dependent diabetics often get into what's called ketoacidosis. They produce so many ketones at such a high level that it causes an enormous amount of problems, but that doesn't happen with the dietary induced ketosis. Um, it simply doesn't. Uh, the mm -hmm. body has a number of pathways that prevent that that just aren't present in, um, in, in folks that have to use insulin. So that's kind of where the confusion comes from. You know, some of the studies show that it may control hunger a little bit better. Often in the short term, there's a little bit better fat loss. One of the, the big uh, confounds is that typically when people go on these low-carb diets, they eat more protein. Mm -hmm. And it's just it's probably the higher protein that's having the, the big benefit. Protein is the most filling nutrient, tends to spare muscle mass loss. And if you're not losing muscle, you're losing more fat, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it's still kind of up in the air whether ketogenic diets really have a necessary, you know, a metabolic advantage. They certainly can have some health benefits in people. You know, they for people that are pre-diabetic have metabolic syndrome. You know, that syndrome X, which is insulin resistance, uh, blood pressure, inflammation. It seems to lowering carbohydrates certainly seems to work better in those folks. Um, over the long term, it doesn't seem to have any really enormous benefit in terms of total weight lost. In the short term, it, it can have some benefits. Um, the, the approach I tend to take to diet overall is it needs to be very context specific. Mm -hmm. And this is where I think a lot of people go wrong. That diet has become very, it's almost a religion and a cult and stuff. And people want to be, there to be one approach that's appropriate for everyone. Right? E even in my first book um, that was all about ketogenic diets, I never really came out and said, here's why you should do it. I, I sort of took the approach that, well, if you're going to do it, here's what you need to know. And here's the pros, and here's the cons, and here's the benefits, and here's the drawbacks. And that's kind of how I approach all these things. Right. right? So and like, real quick, like if you're listening yeah. right now and you're wondering whether you should, like all this stuff that Lila and I are talking about, like anything that you read, you got to try it for yourself. You have to do your research, your due diligence. You have to try it for yourself if you want to do that and see if it works because literally – Every yeah. body, every body is different. So if, you know, what works for, you know, Joe Schmo across the street isn't going to work for you necessarily. It may, but it also it, may not. You know, and that's it all always, depends. Yeah, and I think that's always part of the confusion is for any diet you name, I don't care what it is, you can find a bunch of people that swear by it and a bunch of people that swear at it. That it either works, you know, and it's usually, it's a number of things. It's them finding a diet that fits their, take your pick. Food preferences, food availability, mm -hmm. exercise patterns, psychological patterns. You know, th there's a lot of different things that go into, you know, what's the quote unquote best diet for somebody. And that's the problem I really have with this. Uh, I have the singular best diet. Usually it's someone projecting what worked for them exclusively. It's like, well, it worked for me. It must work for everybody. And if it doesn't work, it means that you didn't follow it. Right. And the coaches do the same thing with training. They have a workout that they give to everybody and if it doesn't work it means that you you failed the idea of, of tailoring it to the individual you know to their situation to their environment is really never taken into account and you know I, I found there's certainly some generalities over which kind of diets tend to go best with certain uh, specific situations mm -hmm. but to your point, there's still some individual variants. There's still, you know, the, the as I've been saying for years, you know, the best diet is the one that you'll stick to. So I don't care if I've got the theoretically best optimal diet in the history of ever. If you won't stick to it, it's not going to work. Yeah, um, yeah. Dan Duchesne used to put it a little bit more bluntly, which is good advice not followed is still shitty advice. And I, I really can't make it, you know, put, I can't make it any clearer than that. I can give you all the advice in the world, but it doesn't fit you or you don't do it. It was bad advice for you. And that's something that I find tends to be forgotten a lot in the diet wars. Right. Right. Um, what are your thoughts on like the, the whole 
like gluten and wheat and things of that nature? That's one another one of those things where people kind of go off the 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 um the they kind of lose their mind, you know. Right. It's a very human thing, right? So what what often happens, kind of getting a little bit off topic, is okay, something comes through and it's healthy, right? Mm-hmm. If it was fiber in the eighties, it was soy in the nineties, it's whatever it is now. So a typical person, ah, if some fiber is good, all the fiber is better. In the 80s, people went nuts. They were eating, you know, soluble fiber by the truckload, fiber brownies, fiber muffins, all this other stuff. Mm-hmm. And on top of all the amazing gas they had, it caused some nutrient imbalances and all this other stuff. So suddenly, flip flop, fiber is bad for you. And there's books out there that are actually like, yep, fiber is dangerous and causes all this because some guy ate a million grams of fiber a day and he had a problem ergo it's evil so he's going to project right soy was the same thing people heard that ah japanese people eat soy and don't have health problems or whatever it was and and so if some soy is good more soy is better right so we had soy in the protein bars soy supplements soy milk soy this what people fail to realize is that the daily intake of soy among asians is like 12 to 15 grams a day Right, it's like one. It's like one serving. It's just like half a serving of protein powder. Suddenly, people are eating fifty to seventy-five grams of soy a day, which <laughs> other problems. And then one person gets thyroid issues or whatever, and writes a book about how soy is evil. It's like no, soy is not evil. Stupidity is evil. That's really the problem. Yeah, that's the truth. Okay. Yeah. All right. So gluten and wheat and all that. This has been one of those things where. There are people that are gluten intolerant. There are people, you know, there's celiac disease, which is a real problem. There's gluten intolerance, and there's a little bit of a difference between those two, where some people eat gluten, which is a protein found in wheat and and a lot of certain carbohydrates, and it causes them stomach indigestion, bloating, slight immunity, you know, that's kind of what a food intolerance is. And I wonder, actually, while while you're talking about that, if gluten intolerance is in any way related to just insulin sensitivity uh i don't think so i think it's more you know usually food intolerances happen when you know you're getting sort of this weird immune response to a protein so those proteins will get through the gut like there's leaky gut syndrome and ibs and stuff and proteins right. get in the body they generate this autoimmune response and then whenever you eat it you kind of get this other issue and it's bloating and there's some stuff that goes along with food intolerances that are pretty common now the reality is most people these things tend to be reported at about 10 times their normal, like what, what the research shows that they occur at. And you see this with food allergies too. True food allergies happen in like a couple of percentage of people. And a true food allergy, like any true allergy, can kill you. Hmm. Right? Food allergy is not when you eat something and get an upset tummy. Right. But an allergy is, an, is when you go into anaphylactic shock and have to go to the hospital to get an epinephrine injection. But people eat And that some- can happen if you eat a peanut in some people. Yeah, if something's truly perfect to peanuts, it, a peanut can kill them. It doesn't make them feel ill or have to go poop. It will kill them. And that's a true allergy. And then there's an intolerance, which is kind of a lesser degree. But <laughs> this will sound terrible, but it's true. People want to be part of something. And a lot of people seem mm-hmm. to have this psychology where they want to have something wrong with them. I've seen this happen for yeah, decades. It's, it's weird. Right? When fibromyalgia was popular, Everybody had fibromyalgia. When adrenal fatigue, which nobody really talks about anymore, was popular, everybody had adrenal fatigue. Hypothyroid, food allergy, you name it. Whatever is kind of the current, the popular disease du jour, there is a percentage of people that MSG, that they just want to be part of something. They want to have, really, Somebody was just telling me the other day that, you know, they're, uh, they, somebody's daughter, a friend of theirs, daughter, something like that, was running around telling everybody that she was a vegetarian. Um, and then one day she walks in, um, and she's like binging on like deli meats and like wow. hot dogs and stuff yeah. like that. And she's like, what the hell are you doing? I thought you were a vegetarian. <laughs> and apparently she was just doing it because, you know, her entire like peer group. Yeah. Or, or, yeah. So it's, it's, there's something to that psychology. All right. So back to gluten, there is certainly a percentage of people who are gluten intolerant, who it causes problems in, but now that. It goes from, well, this is unhealthy for some people to this must be unhealthy for all people. And people turn it into this extremist stance where what's bad for them must be bad for the whole world. Because as we all know, every individual human being represents every single person in humanity. And um, and and that so that that's kind of yeah. And and. 
again, you can, there's lots and lots and lots, same thing with milk, right? So some people are lactose intolerant. I am one of them. When I drink milk, you know, it's typical among Middle Easterners. When I drink milk, it gives me a lot of gas, stomach yeah. upset, et cetera, et cetera. Now I happen to like milk. You know, they have lactate reduced milk. They've got the pills and I'll take, you know, I'll use those. So there's this idea that, ah, humans didn't evolve to drink milk, and that, and that probably is where lactose intolerance came from. However, there's lots of people that can drink milk just fine. At some point, certain populations redeveloped this ability. Mm -hmm. So this idea, and, and usually some of the gluten stuff comes out of the paleo stuff, and this idea that, well, we didn't eat it during our evolutionary past, which is arguably true. Ergo, we're not, we can't use it. What people forget is that evolution didn't stop a million years ago, right? There's actually some really good evidence that about 10,000 years ago, evolution was accelerated by the fact that, you know, by us becoming not hunter-gatherers, right? This mm -hmm. idea that magically evolution stopped in the Paleolithic era and that defines every aspect of modern human physiology is just wrong. Um, make no mistake, there are certain benefits of paleo, the paleo approach, you know, getting more people to eat proteins and vegetables and less concentrated crap, all for it, right? I got no debate with that. This idea that there is a single magic paleo diet that every paleo whatever, and that this is by definition the optimum human diet is a lot of nonsense. Number one, if paleo man were here today, he would eat pizza. I got news for you. <laughs> paleo man didn't eat this by choice. He ate what was available, right? And humans have been shown to adapt to, if, even then, if you look at our evolutionary past, I guarantee you that the Alaskan Inuit were not eating the same diet as the Maasai tribes in South Africa who weren't eating the same thing as hunter-gatherers. They ate what was available. Right. And this idea that there is a single Paleolithic diet based on a self-reported ethnographic food thing from the 20s and 30s is just bullshit. I mean, plain and simple, there is no sing there is no single there was no single Paleolithic diet. We've clearly shown adaptations that allow us to eat things that wouldn't have existed then. And there's also the fact I find that the Paleo guys play a fun game where science is only valid when it supports them. There's a paper a couple years ago suggesting that, yeah, Paleo Man did in fact have some kinds of grains and ate them because they found tools used to crush them. Somehow mm -hmm. that research was invalid, but all the research supporting Paleo is valid. And yeah, again, it's like they'll, they'll decide, they'll do the opposite of science, right? So science is, you know, the, they'll start by, it's all about, you know, asking a question, trying to prove it wrong. Whereas Correct. some camps... Uh, you know, and, and, and I'm not, you know, saying that paleo is, is, is you know, the, they're bad folks or anything like that. I, I it's tried certainly it for not. a long time. There's a lot of benefits in it. I, absolutely. I, I uh, subscribe to a lot of that lifestyle. Yes, yes um, absolutely. But a lot of those guys, they'll, they're so close-minded that they'll start by, they'll make a claim, they'll believe something, they'll begin with a belief, and yes. then they'll try to find research to prove that belief. <laughs> Correct. And anything that doesn't support it is bad science or doesn't yeah, count, yeah. and suddenly research doesn't have all the answers. And to your point, this isn't specific to paleo. Don't anyone listening to this think we're picking on them? Most groups do this. It becomes an ideology rather than a philosophy. Once it becomes, once you are, have decided that this is the way, you will find a way to justify that belief. What's truly been funny is watching the paleo guys who went from absolute, this is paleo, this is not paleo, to somehow rationalizing that certain foods, I've seen paleo plus milk, <laughs> okay? Yeah, um, yeah. I've seen, there was a really, really funny book. It was Paleo for Athletes, and I forget who wrote it. And it was basically like, yep, paleo, protein, vegetables, but somehow energy gels and protein drinks magically we're okay yeah, and, and yeah. the justification was just the the, the silliest you know no, then you've got now you've got people paleo protein powder okay paleo man didn't have protein powder right. paleo muffins right. paleo cookies paleo brownies um when i'm really in a mood and this is usually uh whenever people and i'm like you know what elf paleo man didn't have the internet blogs Central heat and air, glasses, <laughs> medication, cars, shoes, clothing. You want to be paleo? Get your stick. They didn't have Whole Foods either. They didn't have Central Market. They didn't have grass. <laughs> Take your spear, go kill your food, make your own clothes, and live in a hut, and I will be willing. But what it is is it's paleo when they want it to be. Mm -hmm. It's They're very selective, and but then they get really self-righteous about it. It's like, oh, I follow a paleo lifestyle. No, you don't. 
you go CrossFit, you go lift weights in a gym, you drive a car to work, you live in a Western rich country where you have the money to go to Whole Foods, and <laughs> but you're going to be a judgmental prick about it. And that's where I have the big, you know, the bigger problem. It's like, yeah, if you want to be paleo, give me your glasses, give me your laptop. You, well, I just whatever. It's just stop. Just you know, just stop. Yeah, I think that um, you know, being <laughs> try it out. Uh, here's what I subscribe to. I I. I subscribe to the give it a shot, see if it works. Um, I'm big on uh, just for me, what I found what works out best for me happened through a series of several years of just going on an elimination diet, eliminating yeah, okay. certain foods, trying it out. You know, I went vegan for a little while, went paleo for a little while, gluten free for a little while, different things. And right. I, I realized after eliminating things one by one, what worked for me. Right. Um, I, I, it's, it's annoying, I suppose, when you hear somebody spouting off all of these things because, you know, they become self-righteous about a specific thing. You know what I mean? They become closed-minded about it. And like, that's the only way. Paleo yes. are the only way. Um, and I know a lot of folks like that. It's, uh, yeah. It's, and it's again, and again, it's, I see it as it's, it's, it's not even, it doesn't have to, it's, it's irrespective of diet training. You see it. Hell, the average Mac user makes you want to punch somebody in the head. Look, I use Mac. I love my Mac. I've used them. I've used Apple since I was in high school. It's not a way of life. It doesn't make you a superior human being because you bought a computer that was twice as expensive as a PC. It's a freaking brand. It's, it's a brand. Yeah, exactly. Right. What you what you draw, like all this stuff. You see it in and and to me, there's an aspect of human nature, right? It's I, I suspect that, you know, I think, you know, religion sort of tied into that, right? People want to be part of something. They want to be part of a group. They want to be led. They want to be told what to think. And all of these different things, that's why it, it's you see these behaviors that almost approach a religious fervor, that paleo is not only the only way, but they must convert you to their way. Mm -hmm. um, CrossFit, uh, God, man, CrossFit has done it. The guy who set up CrossFit, he set it up like a cult. He made it into an us against them. We have the way. Anyone who doesn't follow the way, Etc. Etc. It's that same kind of mentality, and it ties into some deep aspect of human nature. It ties into the human need, the human need of yeah. significance. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. no, one of the most powerful human needs of, of of them all. It's that you know, with with CrossFit, I think the thing that made it spread like wildfire um, can be a it's, it's a double edged sword. It can be a really good thing. It can be a bad thing, and and that's that it has that family community nature to it. Right yeah. where they can go and they see their friends and they make oh, friends. Oh, absolutely. So. Yeah, but you cannot, you can't deny the social nature. And of course, the internet has made that possible for any subculture you care to name. There are paleo forums, paleo Facebook groups. Like you can always go find a bunch of like-minded people, and you have this instant support and peer group. And I think for a lot of people, you know, fraternities in college fill that same need. It's like, ah, you're in a new school and you don't know anybody. Mm -hmm. Boom, mm -hmm. instant friends. Yeah, go join yeah. the frat. Pledge it, make that your pay them lots and lots and lots of money, and boom, you've got forty instant brothers and people. Absolutely, I agree completely. People respond to that, which isn't a bad thing. Again, make no mistake. You know, and if if being part of a group gets you to stick with something in the long term, and there's even been some some theorizing that that religion plays a, a big role in people's behavior change because yeah, you've got yeah. a group, you've got someone that you have to be accountable to. There's a lot of benefits to that for a lot of people um, for a number of reasons, but it can also, the double-edged sword, like you said, it can go to that other extreme where it goes from, hey, this is something that I've found is really beneficial for me to, if you don't agree with me, you're wrong. And you're a sinner, and you're like it becomes this weird morality, yeah. religious belief system that it's you know fantastic. You know what? There's an old joke. Um, hell, you know, was it a CrossFitter, a vegan, a vegan, and something else? Why, you know, if you run into one of those, it's like don't worry, they'll tell you within five minutes. And it's absolutely <laughs> true. If they're, I kid, I mean, even you'll just hear it all the time. Yeah. So what about CrossFit? I mean, again, I've seen it other places, riding bikes with a guy one time who was into triathlon. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. I did him when I was younger. He's like, yeah, yeah, I think you'd really enjoy getting back into triathlon. Basically, this is what he loves. Yeah. Here yeah. Go, this is what everyone should love. Yeah, people are, we're, we're really good, generally speaking, as human beings at projecting our values on people oh, yeah. real quick. <laughs> Absolutely. But then if they project theirs on ours, well, sin, sin. well don't oppress me. Yeah. Um, yeah, it 
Yeah, so it's it's all of that. And again, you know, like I said, don't I don't want listeners to mishear us. There's a lot of good about paleo. There's a lot of good about vegetarianism in the sense that, yeah, more Americans could eat more vegetables, no doubt. But whenever you they tend to make these dietary comparisons and decide something's superior, they're comparing it to the standard American diet. And the standard American diet is shit. Sad, um, as the I, I, I once jokingly wrote that a du- that a diet of bug spray and Skittles would be better than the standard American diet. And it's only half a joke, right? Compared to what the typical American eats, anything is a step in the right direction because it's so but you're just it's because you're comparing anything to something that's so unbearably appalling yeah. that you see the benefits. And usually somewhere in that, you know, that that happy medium, like, okay, dietary protein helps on a diet, there's this idea, ah. Protein's bad for you. Well, why? Well, because it's high fat. Okay, I have news for you. You can get low fat protein sources. I do it every day. This idea that high protein equals high fat, yeah, it's true for the average American. It probably means uh, cooked to within an inch of its uh, life. It probably means charred, barbecued. That's the issue with the high meat intake. There's also, in America, people that eat a lot of meat typically don't eat a lot of fruits and vegetables. Well, is it the meat? Is it the presence of one or the lack of the other? You look at then, you know, I've gotten the same thing with people, the paleo people. I'm like, look, you can include grains on a diet. And the response is typically, well, fine, if you want to eat 80% carbohydrate, I'm like, that's not what I said, <laughs> right? It's not either or. There is this happy medium. And if you look at most athletic diets, lots of protein from lean and somewhat fattier sources, lots of fruit and vegetables, moderate amounts of grains, moderate amounts of dietary fat. It's like, look, you don't have to be at one. It's not paleo or 80% carbs. It's not fatty, charred meat or no meat. Like there, but that's 10, but again, that appeals to people's mindset of it is, you know, it is one extreme or the other. Extreme mindset. It's kind of like, it also reminds me of the bodybuilding magazines, you know, where um, you see this ripped up, shredded, huge dude on the cover. And it's like, follow Jay Cutler's uh, uh, workout routine. Here it is. Blah, 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 blah. Incline, press, do some leg extensions and, uh, yeah. you know, some uh, cable cable cross and, uh, and and you'll be ripped up. And then take sure. this supplement. And uh, if you're if you're if you've never worked out in your life and you're a 16 year old kid reading that, like I was a 16 year old kid oh, reading yeah, that. And I and I start trying it. Yeah, of course I'm going to see some results, but it's not <laughs> the best yeah. thing to maintain, you know. Um, so, anyways, transitioning yeah. uh, to a question that I get actually quite a bit. Uh, this being a self improvement, personal development podcast, and that being the primary thing that I write about and talk yeah. about and help people with, and that is the question of. How do I stick to X, Y, Z program? Yeah. Oh, you know God. what I mean? Yeah. Routine, diet. How do I lose these pounds and keep them off? Because a lot of times people will will, will want to do something. They'll have that initial motivation. They'll, they'll get all pumped up and figure out a way to inspire themselves. And then like, you know, what happens with most New Year's resolutions is they'll sure. stick with it for the first week or two. And then, you know, 50 plus percent of people drop it and forget yeah. about it until next year. Yeah, if not more than that. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. And this is something I've been thinking about, you know, for years and years and years. Because the reality is, and this is true of all behavioral changes, right? We know how to achieve them. We've known for 40 years how to get someone to lose weight or fat. We know what to do. And we have since the dawn of forever, right? I keep seeing, you know, researchers keep hashing out, oh, this much fiber, or this much, you know, we, look, we know the answer. There's a reality that anyone who goes on a diet will lose weight and or fat to one degree or another, right? Mm. The problem is that they invariably will gain it back. Some will gain back even more. You know, that that's the issue. The issue isn't how to do it. The issue is how do we get people to actually do this stuff in the long term? Yeah. Yeah. And you see the same thing in you know, alcohol treatment, smoking, exercise programs. Uh, it's it's and the, and the statistics actually tend to be pretty similar across different domains mm-hmm. and success rates and the failure rates. And to me, this suggests that there's there's something that we're missing. Like there's something again that's inherent to human behavior that makes it very very difficult for most of these things to succeed. And I don't know I don't exactly know what the answer is. I mean it's something that's really been on my in my mind for a lot of years and I've actually been writing about it some recently for another project. And there's actually quite a bit of research that that tends to be sort of ah what what 
you know, discriminates successful behavior changers versus unsuccessful. And there's a you know, there's a lot of different reasons. Um, some of the ones that tend to, I think, that apply to diet and exercise type stuff is there's often, you know, people have enormously unrealistic expectations in mm. terms of how quickly it's going to come off, how easily it's going to come off, and how much is going to come off. And of course, this is unfortunately promoted by a lot of dieting literature. Mm -hmm. 30 pounds in 30 days, and every diet book that has the secret will tell you, yep, this is going to be a quick and easy way to lose weight. You know, they all tell you not to count calories and then trick and eat and less anyway. And people fall into this trap of they just have these ridiculous expectations. They want it to be over in a few weeks. They approach the entire process in such an ass backwards way. <laughs> Frequently, you know, especially with diet and exercise, they think that that diet that these these changes are short term. Aha, I'll just cut my food and exercise for three weeks and then magically the weight will stay off. And I've joked for a lot of years that pretty much diet book authors are distilling the following four points into a 300 page book which is eat less exercise repeat forever mm -hmm. it's forever that's the problem yeah. and people don't seem to realize that at least some part of these behavior changes have to be maintained now not all of it right your diet and your mate you know what what it takes to lose weight and fat and what it takes to maintain that are not necessarily the same thing frequently diet you know what you do during the diet phase per se may be different than what you're doing at maintenance but people jump from one extreme to the other they jump from I'm on a diet to yep I'm gonna eat the way I used to and and that doesn't work I'm gonna exercise for three weeks and then I'm going to not go to the gym again and are shocked when everything returns to normal that's on top of again these unrealistic expectations I read a paper just or sorry people just recently and they asked folks you know what what they thought how much they wanted to lose and they wanted to see something like a 32 percent reduction in body weight right mm -hmm. that means a 200 pound person is going to 140 so at the end of the study they lost half that they lost 16 percent and it was something like 16 kilos so they had mm -hmm. actually lost about 30 pounds and over half of people were dissatisfied with that that's unfortunate right? they, but they go into it with such because the expectations. Yes, the under, yeah, the and the expect and the, there's also again going back to the puritanical thing that if you didn't if you're not perfect, if you didn't hit exactly get to your goal, well you're just a total failure. It's this weird either or mentality that gets promoted in a lot of literature. It's how people approach it, you know, the paleo thing. Ah, a food is paleo or not paleo. Well, if you eat a non-paleo food, you're no longer part of the you're no longer part of the group. You have broken a moral Obli it's just clean eating is even worse. The clean eaters are nuts. And same thing, they justify what's clean and unclean on a day-to-day -day basis, but it, it becomes a moral issue. And when people fail to reach their goals, or they break their diet for a day, or they, you know, they tend to over they do you do the math. Okay, I want to lose two pounds a week, thousand calories a day, that should be eh. Eight pounds a month, boom, I'll be there in three months. And it never works out that way. It's always slower than you expect. It, it always takes longer. And people get frustrated. They also think it's going to be easy because the first few weeks always are, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you see the massive so, improvements initially, and then all of yeah, a sudden you see you know, them taper off, and you have to manage that. You're pumped. You're not hungry. You're enthusiastic about the diet. The weight's falling off you. And then the first plateau hits or the hunger starts to sink in or the first diet break happens. And going into it with these horribly unrealistic expectations to begin with is a huge part of the problem. I think a lot of it has to do with just this and in, in every domain of life. And that's why I'm always curious and I ask folks, especially, you know, people that are specialists in a specific arena about this. Um, yeah. and why I just asked you, cause I think a lot of it has to do with self-imposed like psychological warfare. You know what oh, I mean? Yeah. Um, yes. cause with any goal, right. It, the, the most sustainable way to do it is figure out what you want, right? What's the ideal outcome here? Um, and then figure out how to do it. But in the middle there, I think the way to sustain it is to, like you just touched on, manage your expectations right. and figure out why you want it. What is the ultimate purpose? Because like with specifically to health and fitness, right? A lot of people will set the goal of, I want to lose 30 pounds by April 15th. Um, and w their why might not necessarily be strong enough because they want to do that for a wedding or they want to do that so they could look good in a bathing suit. 
Yes. Um, so they'll bust their ass to do it. They'll, you know, they'll eat clean. They'll, you know, starve themselves. They'll do whatever it takes, um, oftentimes unhealthy ways of doing it. And uh, they'll achieve their goal. They'll get, they'll get their goal. They'll get there. And then they'll say, okay, now I'm done. Um, <laughs> and then they'll fall into depression. Whereas yes. I think the, a good way to do it, especially in terms of the health and fitness uh, approach is, Hey, you know, maybe, maybe let's not say I want to lose 30 pounds by April 15th so I can look good in this suit or this bathing suit or with my shirt off or whatever. Instead, maybe let's say I want to, I want to lose 30 pounds or whatever initially. And I want to maintain that so I can have peak physical, you know, be in peak physical condition, have, uh, the energy and vitality that I want. And I want to figure out different ways to maintain that and sustain that, not just till uh, for, for the wedding or for, you know, bathing suit season, but so that I could live a good, clean, healthy, energetic life. (laughs) The thing is, I don't think that's most people's motivation, right? You know, that's something it's like, okay, so you ask someone, why do you want to whatever, get in shape? If they're honest, (laughs) They'll give you the real reason. Yeah, they want to look yeah. better naked. That's it. In most cases, if they're older, they might want to be healthier, If you know, whatever, increase their functional capacity or whatever it is. But let's face it. Most people do this to look better naked. This is just the reality of the world. <laughs> and most people could give a damn about health function. You know, it's not always the case. One thing I used to see with clients that was really interesting is they'd always come in going, got to lose weight, want to lose weight, blah, blah, blah. And then about three weeks, three or four weeks in, when they were starting to get frustrated, something would happen. I remember specifically a client went hiking with her husband and two kids and was able to not only keep up with the husband, but to carry her kids. And suddenly her attitude changed. Suddenly it went from, I want to lose weight to, wow, I really like the fact that I had this really, this major increase in my overall, you know, life capacity or whatever. They can pick up the grocery bags or, you know, whatever it is. And frequently Mm -hmm. when that happens at some, if they make it that far, that's that that can sometimes change the mindset Um, there's actually a really weird little paper i just saw recently where people kind of reported on what they people think that that losing weight is going to change their life and it can you know some of the stuff you mentioned but that's not what they think people thought and this was i think women more so than men but men have their own issues that losing weight would make them more attractive get them a boyfriend get them a job like they just had these these ideas about you know with men the like see so like you know you mentioned young young males right which is just the target audience for the bodybuilding maga they think mm-hmm. that if I get jacked in a six pack I'll get laid that's mm-hmm. what it comes down to women will fall at my feet and of course the magazines promote that and when it doesn't happen they just like why 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 bought you know they yeah. I've got a six pack. Well, because you still, number one, you still have no personality. Number two, a lot of women don't want a guy that's more neurotic about their body than they are. Yeah, and you're, yeah. no f- you're no fun because you won't go out and have a drink or go do anything fun. Nobody wants that unless they're another fitness crazed person. But, you know, they, they, people have these, these ideas, not only their expectations of, you know, the magnitude and ease of the weight loss, but how their life is just going to magically change because they don't realize that, Make no mistake, people, overweight people, unattractive people in this world have it much harder. Every study shows that's the case. They get treated more poorly. They get paid less. They don't get, I mean, no doubt it's much harder in this world. But thinking that getting to this magic weight loss goal that's probably out in left field in the first place will make that all magically go away is a pipe dream expectation. And, you know, to your point, it would be great if people would just focus on being, you know, try to get healthier and fitter and live a better life. You know, there's even been some argument that I think there's something to it. It's like, look, don't focus on just weight loss or fat loss. And there's focus on getting fitter, focus on getting healthier, fo- whatever it is. And that tends to generate fat loss. Not always, because there's a lot of people, people can go wrong. Um, but, you know, I, I've got a rule, which, or joking, sort of a rule, which is no matter how fast you're losing, you always want it to be twice, twice that. Yeah, you're losing yeah. one pound a week, you want two pounds a week. You want two pounds a week. You want four. If you're getting five, you want 10. The weight loss, the fat loss never happens as quickly as you want it. And if that's your only metric, you're going to get frustrated. Whereas if you've got a different sort of external metric, whether it's 
going a little bit longer on the treadmill, improving your fitness, whatever it is, changing your diet little by little by little, that can frequently generate the fat loss without focusing on the fat loss, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think it has a lot to do also with, you know, at least at least for me, w w one of the things that I realized with with improving my health and fitness and just the for me as a, as a younger kid, just totally out of shape, fat kid, uh, very shy, had no confidence, didn't look didn't wasn't pleased when I looked in the mirror um, and, you know, all the, the stuff that kids would say to kids when, you know, making fun of you and stuff like that as, as a kid, you know, initially those, 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 uh, external extrinsic motivators were there, right? Yes. I, I want to, I'm going to get ripped up and I'm going to get all the girls and I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to do this. And then what I started realizing was, is that when I did begin to, you know, pick up on that initial motivation factor of, you know, doing all that stuff for the aesthetic reasons was that I started realizing that, hey, you know, setting a fitness goal for myself um, and measuring my progress, that actually creates a little bit of discipline in my life too, doesn't it? Wow. Okay, cool. Um, so now not only do I look a little bit better, but I can also, I'm setting goals. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm becoming a more disciplined individual. That's kind of pouring into my schoolwork. That's kind of pouring into my emotional uh, levels. I'm becoming more confident. I'm not afraid to speak up. I'm not afraid to even, you know, defend myself. Um, now, now I can, you know, do all these different things. And it sort of ended up pouring into every other arena of my life, physically, yes. obviously, uh, mentally, emotionally, and even spiritually. You know, um, so I think it all depends on perspective, right? And, and, and striking a balance between those four basic dimensions, those four core needs of, of our nature as human beings. Oh, absolutely. Um, and sort of going to what you're taught, yeah, there's been a lot of interest recently about, you know, external versus internal, motor, you know. Intrinsic motor, versus extrinsic. Yeah. Extrinsic versus intrinsic. And then, you know, what they're finding is this idea of getting, you know, they're looking at it mainly in education, but I think it applies, is that when you basically give people nothing but extrinsic rewards. Ah, you got a good grade, you get to go get pizza, or you get a gold star, or whatever it is, that you sort of train them to only work for those extra external rewards. If those aren't happening, they give up. Yeah. Whereas folks that have sort of an intrinsic motivation to get better for the sake of getting better, or to the study for the sake of studying, or whatever it is, that they tend to do better in the long term. Absolutely, um, yeah. Intrinsic motivators are definitely, for the long term, Yes. Far more effective. I think the question then becomes, and I haven't looked into this and you probably have more than I, is how much, some of that is hardwired. Some of that, you know, whether people are process or goal oriented, which is a similar idea, whether they care only about the end result or about how they get there. There seems to be a little bit of hardwiring in there, but there also, I wonder how much of that can be taught if it changes over time, if extrinsic, you know, frequently for, you know, for people that are starting out, let's face it. It's kind of like the willpower thing. Yeah. Willpower, which is now they've realized is a biological construct and limited and all this other stuff. Like willpower as an, an only approach to behavior change is uh, a dead end road. Yeah. However, right, it can't you can't do it. You can't have that much will it just doesn't work forever. We got too much else pressing on us. However, initially behavior change may take that right people that don't want to work out i guarantee i guarantee you they're going to force themselves to go to the gym right, right. they're going to have to go today i don't want to do it but i'm going at the three to four week mark they see that first fitness improvement maybe that they say oh wow now i want to see. you know i'm wondering if and what starts as pure you know eventually willpower turns into behavior hopefully turns into habit if you stick with it long yeah enough. that's what i see i see what you're saying so it's yeah and that's a very common thing like yeah. um and, and an excellent there's there's a number of books that i'll just put in the show notes here that that are great for this one of them being drive written by yeah. daniel pink um and then the the power of habit is another good one and uh the seven habits of highly effective people which everybody's heard of you know those are yes. three good books to to refer to on this but uh one of the things is is we need that initial willpower for just long enough to sustain a habit, to, to develop a habit. Um, because what's a habit, right? A habit is an automatic response to uh, a situation, right? To a stimulus. Yes. 
Yes. Um, so if you have not yet developed a habit, but you want that habit, then you initially need to use willpower um, to get yourself to do something. So it's going to be tough to do it. Um, but once you do that for a certain period of time, and that time varies for everybody, but yes. it's usually uh, from a study, I think it was in the a, a UK study, uh, it's uh, on average 66 days uh, yeah. to develop a habit. And so for that 66 days, for most of us, it's going to freaking suck. It's going to suck. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. if we can get ourselves to get through that uh, and to, to muster up the willpower to, to keep on doing it, then after that, eventually we'll be on cruise control. And I think that's the thing that we need to get in our heads. You know what I mean? Yes. I, yeah, I agree completely. That's that Again, that goes to that. People want it to happen overnight. You know, people, this is sort of that trite explanation. example. It's like, ah, oh, look, it took you 20 years to gain this weight. You're not going to lose it in 10 weeks. Or, and I think even deeper than that, you know, you've got, if you've got, 10, 15, 20 years of cue-driven food behaviors. And, and they're enormous. People don't realize how much of this stuff is just working at an unconscious level. Mm -hmm. That takes time to get rid of. And despite some early ideas that the behaviors eventually extinguish, that's not actually true. Those, those habits are always there, right? You talk to someone who smoked and has quit for 20 years, and they will tell you, I crave every day. Yeah. yeah. They, that, never go, that never goes away. Same thing with food, same thing with drug and alcohol and substance abuse. Food is almost more difficult because, you know, I, look, I'm sure you have as well, but you, know, you look into sort of the substance abuse literature, and there's a lot of stuff on relapse prevention and things of that. And, you know, one of the easiest strategies if you're trying to quit to, to, to get away from alcoholism, don't go to the bar. Don't hang around with people that, that drink. Don't be in those environments that are going to trigger a temptation that early on you're not going to be able to resist. Absolutely. Food, in the modern environment, food is different, right? And there's been some interest that food, there may be a food addiction concept, maybe not, but it certainly shares some similarities with drug addiction. But the difference is that you cannot get away from food in this country and in this world. You, food is a, you know, you don't need alcohol to live. You don't need drugs to live. You don't need cigarettes to live. You got to eat. Yeah, food is fundamentally different in that it is required, and we are surrounded. We are beset in every direction by cues to eat lots of inexpensive, palatable, calorie laden food. The mm -hmm. only way to avoid it, you know, and it's funny because bodybuilders and physique athletes do that. If you're willing to become an antisocial hermit, <laughs> they do. But you think you laugh, but you know it's true. These yeah. guys don't go out. They don't go to parties. They take their chicken breast and broccoli to work and sneak into the bathroom. They don't. I have was that guy for a long oh, yeah. time. <laughs> I've, seen, I've seen women. I've seen people go. I can't go to a movie with my significant other because it would interfere with one of my meal times. Yeah. Like yeah. It's, at that point, it's an eating disorder. But they take it. That's what they do. They, but most people aren't going to do that, and it's not realistic. Yeah. So get, getting away from those enormous number of cues is just damn near impossible, and I think that makes it a lot more difficult. You've got habits that are established long term. Those types of foods are part of almost every social interaction you will, unless you're in a very health conscious place, and even then, if you are in an office, I guarantee you there's junk food in the, the break room. Uh, I was in the hospital years ago and people bring the nurses brownies and cakes and cookies all the time and they're around it and they're bored and willpower only goes so far when the temptation is constant. What are you going to do? Not go to a dinner party? Not go to your friends when they invite you over? Because And if you do go and you don't eat, people are going to think you're a rude asshole. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, so much of our modern societal just everything revolves around food and everywhere you look, commercials, radio, TV, advertisements, the mall, no matter where you go, you cannot get away from it. And fighting a lot of those cues can be way more difficult, I think, for food than not going to a bar. It's easy. Just don't walk in the bar. It's yeah, what, what some people call it a bright line boundary where rather than trying to, you know, uh, an alcoholic that wants to fail will three weeks in go, yeah, I think I can go to the bar and not drink. And then a three-day bender later, they have learned a valuable lesson, and it's better for them to not even be around the temptation. That is a bright line boundary. I'm not going to the buffet. 
I'm not going, you know, I'm not keeping cookies in the house. People think that their willpower and that their habits are established a lot earlier than they are. That three week rule is bullshit. Yeah, that and three week rule is absolute, absolute bullshit. The, the study you're referring to, the range was like 16 to 244 days. Like yeah. it was just, for some people, it's quick. And for other people, it could be a year. And that's a real, another expectation people have to manage. Doing it for, for three weeks, you're still in that introductory phase of your behavior change. You're nowhere close to fixed or cured or done or whatever. Yeah. It has to be a long-term process on some level. I think there's other stuff that, I mean, we probably would have to have another entire podcast for this. You get into, you know, how people, what's what the relapse, the drug people call it an abstinence violation effect. It's like, okay, you just broke your whatever, whatever behavior you're trying to change. Mm -hmm. How you cope with that, how you frame that, how you deal with that, drastically affects what happens next. And what I see in dieting because of this puritanical mentality, this tendency to make foods into good or bad, clean or unclean, paleo or unclean, right or wrong, it becomes a moral issue. So people break their diet or go whatever, they eat the cookie, whatever the hell it is. And suddenly it's it's not, I had 100 calories, who cares? It's, oh my God, I'm weak. I'm yeah. a failure. I'm Fuck it, I'm eating a whole thousand calorie bag. <laughs> I can tell you that that's exactly that's exactly what I used to do. Oh, it's and say and I did too, and it took me years to get past that. And I mean, hell, I wrote an entire book, and and I just just so I haven't ranted about this much lately, right? So lately, the big thing online: flexible dieting. If it fits your macros, everybody's on the bandwagon. <laughs> Two thousand five, I wrote a book about this. 10 years ago that everyone mostly ignored, right? I was pretty much the first guy to write formally about flexible dieting and why it, why it represents a far better approach to the extremist attitude that people not only impose upon themselves, but most of this dieting literature imposes. What was that? What was the book called so I can uh, link it's, it up in the show notes? It's called A Guide to Flexible Dieting because while I'm a great writer, I suck at titles. <laughs> basically sort of looked at some of this psychology um, in a you know this was years ago and and I've thought about it a lot more since then and so you know basically tried to approach this this all or nothing attitude what's called a dichotomous against this black and white mentality that people fall into and there's just study after study after study show that people that take a more flexible approach to dieting have better results and this is another place where this is very different from drug and substance abuse mm -hmm. if you're an alcoholic if you were a drug addict you can't really have a little right you, you can't yeah. go well i'm going to abstain today except a little heroin it doesn't really work. this is a this is a place where it's almost it's almost easier with eating habits because with drug and substance abuse, it pretty much is absolute. You don't get to fool around with that because you're going to go off, off, the, off the rails. With food, it's a little bit easier because if you – with these flexible dieting approach because, you know, that, that food is not going to put you in a situation where you're simply going to – I mean, can it? Some people have trigger foods. Some people have tried to implement flexible dieting and it just doesn't work for a number of reasons, and, and the reasons for that would take far too long to explain. And, and it's a great approach. When it works, it works fantastically. The number of people who did read my book who said, this basically changed my life. This changed the way I looked and dealt with food. And suddenly they went from breaking their diet every other week or going completely off the rails to, yeah, I just planned it or I included a little bit every, you know, not all the time. They're not doing it constantly despite, despite what people think. But being able to allow it sometimes takes the pressure off, right? If I tell yeah. you, you can never watch TV again. That's all you're ever, you tell a kid that, that's all they're ever going to want to do. Absolutely. If I say, look, you can watch TV for a couple, you know, whatever. You can watch TV two hours a week or an hour, whatever it is. Suddenly it's like, but you have to do your homework first year or whatever it is. Suddenly the psychology changes from never to, well, sometimes. And yeah. that takes the psychological pressure off completely. Yeah, that's a really interesting thing. I, I you know, the, the, the point of, how with food being one of those few things that you can, um, you know, impose that flexibility on and uh, that being sort of the key to, to sustainable success for a lot of people. I kind yes. of stumbled on that after, you know, uh, eliminating things one by one, experimenting with different things, uh, going through the phase of, you know, the, uh, 
the 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 morality phase of you know nice. you cannot do this and you know trying to impose that on other people and like just not going out because I don't want to you know be by popcorn or whatever. Right. Um, and uh, you know I kind of eventually stri- was able to strike a balance on that in that regard for myself and yes. luckily now I can uh, enjoy have an enjoyable social life as well as a nice and healthy you know. Uh, uh, physical, you know, fitness as well. So. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, basically, once you kind of realize that doing this, again, not all the time, but doing it every once in a while tends to have almost zero negative, or sometimes beneficial effects. Yeah. Sometimes I've seen this a lot. You know, I've written about it in a couple different books and on my website, there's a silly thing called of wishes and squishy fat. And there's this, re- there's this weird effect where people will be dieting, and I think there's another reason people get frustrated and quit. People want dieting and fat loss to be linear. Ah, I've I've met my deficit. I should lose a pound a week. And if it doesn't happen, they're like, "Why screw this? Yeah. I went up today." And I'm like, "Well, water balance. There's food in your in your. You know, you didn't poop today. There's all kinds of things that throw off short term scale weight. Mm-hmm. But occasionally, you just see this weird thing where people stall for a couple of weeks. It's probably water retention. It's just a lot of things. Yeah. The body the body sucks sometimes. It just does this weird stuff. And I've seen people do it all. And sometimes you, you can structure this. They're like, you know what? I've been dying for a month. Nothing's happened. F this. And they go and they eat for a couple days and they don't go to the gym. And Monday, five pounds lighter. Um, because they've taken, you know, that that stress response, that big cortisol-induced water retention that they're mm. doing. I have to lose weight and I got to exercise and all this other shit. Suddenly just like, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to go eat for a couple days and not go to the gym and stress goes down and cortisol goes down and boom, overnight it happens. So like sometimes not only does does going off your diet or you know doing that stuff not have any negative effect, sometimes it has nothing but an enormous beneficial effect. Yeah. Even yeah. in the short term, not even just long term adherence, but in the short term sometimes that will kick off that weird wish effect because you went out and actually, and I'm not telling, again, don't want readers to mishear this. I'm not saying that you should do this every single night so that you wake up lighter. This is not what I'm saying. <laughs> to, to, so in my experience, here's how it was. And maybe this works for, for you. Maybe it doesn't for, for you listening. Like you bust your ass, you bust your ass, you bust your ass for an extended period of time. And then you give yourself that release every now and then. Yes. And when you give yourself that release, it's kind of like, ah, oh, you know what I mean? Yes. It, it, stress goes down. You're not so worried about that structure. You're not trying to maintain a specific thing. It's just like, man, let me just enjoy this for a little bit. Whatever this is for you. Yes. And, and you know, yes. cortisol yeah. goes down. All the, all the stuff kind of relaxes for you and your physiology, your psychology, your emotions. And, uh, you know, wake up the next day and you look ripped. (laughs) Yep. Key aspect of that is busting your ass for the extended period first, right? This is sort of one of my jokes. We we didn't get much into training, but, you know, there's this the high intensity training approach, which is, ah, you train very intensely, you you grow when you rest. So I joke with people, I'm like, yeah, so I worked out last year and I'm going to rest for two years and I should win the Olympia, right? (laughs) Not exactly how it works. Same thing with this whoosh effect and this release effect. It only works if you've been actually adhering to your diet for a while for that to happen. And, you know, something else I actually recommend, this is all inflexible dieting. You know, I talked about sort of free meals where you just allow yourself to have, you know, a meal that's not quote unquote on your diet. Mm. Not that you go to a buffet and fill your face with everything you can put down, but it lets you, you know what, go out with your significant other and your kids, and if you want to have the fries, have the damn fries. If you want to have the bread and you're on a low-carb diet, have the damn bread. It won't kill you. You know, free meal, I talked about refeeds, which are kind of these longer periods of carbohydrate overfeeding. Mm-hmm. But something I talked about is a full diet break. And, and this idea that you, you know, you, you address this in what you were talking about, to actually take a break from that that strict goal, people don't think in those terms, right? And, and I talked about a couple years ago on a podcast, right? Athletes have short, medium, long-term goals, but they don't go all out seven days a week, 365 a year, right? They t- usually take at least one day off a week, a couple mm-hmm. easy days. Every fourth week, they'll go a little bit lighter. Usually most athletes, two or three weeks out of the year, they sit around and do nothing, right? They have to de-stress from the physical, mental, emotional, psychological stress of the intense training. Yet dieters think that this is a 24-7, 365 thing that they're never, ever going to – and that's just overwhelming. For someone that has a lot of fat to lose, telling them that they're going to have to be 
in what they perceive as a sense of deprivation for the next year or two, nobody can survive that, right? There's yeah, also yeah. an issue that I'm sure you're aware of. The closer something is, the more we value it, and the further away it is, the more we devalue it. It's sort of a temporal discounting thing, yeah, right? Yeah. So if you're faced with cake now versus a goal that's a year away, I guarantee you the cake wins. Yep. Because yep. Same that, thing with money. They've done research and studies, which I can't really think of right now, yeah, but absolutely. know exist, where it's like, hey, they, they present people with, they say, I'll, I can give you a $100 bill right now, or if you want to wait just one year, we'll double yeah. that and guarantee you $200. Which one yes. do you want? And they exactly. take the 100 bucks. Always, yeah. Now, if it, at some point, you know, it, it can switch. If suddenly it's like $100 now, or five hundred dollars. It depends. You know, you're you're doing humans do this weird comparison in their head of what the overall value is and whether it's worth waiting and all this other. But yeah, I know those. Are the, it's the same sort of thing. It's like, well, eat a piece of cake now, or maybe reach my goal in a year. Screw it, I'm having the cake. Yeah, so, yeah. breaking up the diet into shorter periods helps with that. You know, one of the big keys to good goal setting, you know, is that S M A R T model uh, specific measurable, achievable, uh, attainable, relevant, and um, time-constrained, right? Mm -hmm. If you go, eh, I want to get into shape whenever, you'll never get there. It's, it's a non-specific goal. It's non-measurable, and there's no time frame. If you go, okay, I want to increase from walking five minutes to running 30 minutes in two months, specific, it's measurable, it's time-constrained. It's the same thing with dieting is if you go, eh, I just want to lose weight, whenever you've just failed, you've, you've already set yourself up for failure, going, okay, I want to lose eight pounds, like, you know, whatever you said, however many, whatever it is, 10 pounds in the next three months, specific, it's measurable, achievable is where people get into problems, people pick these goals that are unrealistic, stuff like the biggest loser has made people think, if I'm not losing 20 pounds a week, I'm doing it wrong, yeah, and yeah. I'm sorry, but no. But um, yeah, you set that specific, but you need to set it in a reasonable time frame so that it seems achievable. 100 pounds in two years, that is too far away to be of, to think of. If you go, well, if I can lose 12 pounds in three months and then another 12 and another 12 and another, well, whatever, you can, it also, you plan what I call that full diet break, which is a one to two week span where you basically move to maintenance. You kind of bring your calories back up a little bit. You may cut your training back depending on kind of the specifics. And there's actually a really weird study I talked about in my book where what they wanted to do was figure out what happened when people went off a diet, like what caused them to break and, and fail. So they put them on a diet for six weeks. They said, okay, we want you to take a two-week two to six, two week or six-week break hmm. so they could see what happened. And what they saw happen was that nobody gained a lot of weight and everybody got right back on the diet. So the study failed completely. What they wanted to measure, they were not able to measure. But I think they found – they made a, kind of a cooler observation. For some reason, these people parsed that break differently psychologically. Rather than see – here's how, what happens to most people. Up, oh, I'm on my diet crap, I'm going to be out of town for three days, I'm not going to be able to stick to my diet, screw it, I quit, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's out of control, it's unplanned. There's a ton of research that when you feel a lack of control over your life, that stress goes way up. Sapolsky's written about this extensively. Right, Having, right. Um, if you shock rats and give them a, a stick to chew on or a button to press, if they think it's helping, their stress levels go down because they yeah. think they're in control. And I think what happened in this study was these people didn't see those two weeks, weeks as a failure of their diet. They saw it as part of the plan. Mm. They saw, ah, I was instructed to do this as part, and when people go into studies, they want to make the researchers happy. They, they, they kind of want to do that. So if the researcher says do this, they go, oh, well, this is part of what I'm supposed to be doing. Mm. So being this weird, uncontrolled, potentially guilt-inducing thing, it's like, oh, this is just part of my program. Part of the plan. So, so they didn't beat themselves up, they didn't go off the rails, and they got right back on the diet. And I just structured this formally. Um, it's got a lot of benefits, to your point, psychologically, physiologically. It's like, okay, for a couple weeks, I don't have to be meticulous. I don't have to drive myself crazy. Like, you shouldn't go to the other extreme, but you get to just have a mental, physical, psychological, emotional break. Um, it can also help with some of the physiology of, you know, all of the hunger hormones and metabolic hormones and kind of let you, you know, you've lost some. Okay, let's stabilize that new level. Now you're not starting from 
250 pounds. Now you're starting from 258 pounds or whatever, or 248 pounds, 230, whatever the math is. Right, you've lost that. This is your new baseline. Now let's make the next block. All right, 10, 12 more weeks of dieting where you have to be a little bit more strict about your training and stuff. All right, now you get another break. It breaks the dieting into manageable time, just the way athletes break their training into manageable time periods. Incremental progress. Plus your ass for 12 weeks, take five days off. Yeah. Bust your ass for 12 more, but you know you've got that break. Um, Love it. I, you know, I found yeah, on my own training, true. six days a week with one day off is completely different than seven days because there's no break because then it's just – 7, 14, 21, it's relentless. You never get it, even if it's physically easy. Mentally, you just want a day to sit around and not have to go do it. Yeah. And what I found for myself is that, you know, I just, uh, so with my workout regimen right now and the routine or ritual that I've developed that I've been maintaining for the last probably couple of years now is just, uh, psychologically speaking, it's just I plan on working out seven days a week, but, 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 and this is a huge, but inevitably one day of that week, something comes up, something that I was, that was unplanned or something important arises that prevents me from, from doing it. This is inevitable. It happens once yes. a week, um, it, at least in my schedule. And I realized that, okay, so if that one day a week that if I know that I need to take off one day per week, um, then I'll just plan on working out seven days a week and that inevitable day, however, whichever random day that it falls on, um, will be my day off. And that yes. works out for me. <laughs> no, absolutely. There, there's a guy, one of my, a good friend of mine, a guy online, uh, <clears throat> he's been I learned coach. that by the way, from Greg Plitt, may he rest in peace. Um, who I'm sure you know who, who that guy yeah. is, but. Anyways, um, but there's a buddy of mine named Don, Dan John who writes a lot, and he's been involved in in fitness and training and sports forever and ever and ever. And he said that you know because athletes will periodize and have these complicated four week schedules and plan their easy weeks and stuff. And he's like, look, the average person doesn't need to periodize, and here's why: life gets in the way. If you are not you know a full time or professional or even serious amateur athlete, the reality is that to your point. Every month, something's coming up, right? Mm -hmm. Something is going to come up that's going to keep you out of the gym, that's going to keep you from making your perfectly designed regimen schedule, and that's fantastic. You don't need it. For a lot of people, you don't need to plan it in because, just like you said, something is going to get in the way. Yeah. And mm -hmm. the you know the the issue, and this is actually a, a recently had a whole separate thing, and was some exercise recommendations, and they go, yeah, well, what we what we recommend is that people we recommend they make exercise seven times a week because they might make five. And as someone who used to coach a lot of people, it's, you know, the, that's true. It's like if we tell them to do five days a week, they might make three. Mm. So that's that's a place where your your approach, you know, yeah, aim aim for seven, but you also have to be content with not getting there. And that can for some, you have to have that psychological framing of look I'm not going to see missing that seventh day as a failure or a lack of willpower it's just something that came up and was out of my control that's fine absolutely rather than what people do the same thing with exercise they do with diet usually in the first two or three weeks they're consistent then something comes up kid gets sick late at work whatever it is they figure well I missed a day I've lost every benefit that I could have possibly gained I quit <laughs> and they fall into that exact same trap that if they're not perfect, they're a failure. And it's this weird, again, it's a, it's, it's a poor psychological approach that leads to poor psychological coping that leads directly into relapse. If you see it, you know, the, the, the anonymous groups, well, I don't agree, you know, I don't think they have the entire answer. This one day at a time thing, there's much to that. It's like, look, what happened today, if you've been dieting for three weeks, one meal doesn't matter. Hell, one day doesn't matter. You cannot undo three weeks of dieting in a day unless you really, and it just doesn't happen that way. Right. But people think it does. People think that this day is the only one that matters. If I failed today, I've ruined everything. This isn't facilitated by people only using the scale, right? If you're on a low-carb diet and you go eat a bunch of bread, your weight went up by five pounds. Holy shit. Like, well, it's look, that's water. You didn't, yeah. it's because... Again, another issue that gets into this is people, have, the way they're tracking that measurable aspect is so poor, they don't realize the daily weight changes and it has nothing to do with really the calories you ate. Eat a bunch of sodium, weight goes up. 
drop your carbs, weight goes down in a week, in a day span, doesn't matter. Use a seven day rolling average, compare every month, whatever it is, but folk, people go nuts on these day to day fluctuations. Um, and they just don't mean anything. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, man, we, so much good stuff here. Dude, all right, so totally transitioning. I got to tell you, so uh, we've been having a good conversation. You're an incredibly intelligent guy. Oh, thank you. Um, and, and I'm enjoying this, and I've learned a lot from you even before this conversation just on the, on the, in, the, in the area of, like, intermittent fasting, which I don't even think we've touched on yet. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> surprisingly— when I so when I, I googled you and I see all this crazy stuff, and I gotta ask you, is it is it like a self marketing thing or what is it? And why do so many people um, have 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 so many negative negative commentaries on you? Um, <laughs> yeah. And I'm sure you're laughing it off at this point, but man, it's it's pretty intense. Yeah. It, it, it actually it wasn't kind of a deliberate thing. It just kind of came out of the early days of the internet and sort of got into this thing where I just, you know, like shitting on people verbally. And it was fun and I enjoyed it. And like, no, it really wasn't a marketing thing. Like it was just kind of fun to do. And then it became a habit and then it just kind of became sort of part of what I was, you know, because it was part of my stick basically. And, um, you know, that, and so yeah, and a lot of people, and there's also a lot of people don't like, especially from a financial, you know, a lot of the people in the fitness industry, the other professionals, mm -hmm. is they market a lot of crap. Yeah. And I'm very vocal about calling out crap. So they kind of don't like me for that reason. Uh, when people say dumb stuff, I tend to A, call them out, B, show them facts, and then C, call them an idiot. And it's really that, you know, there, there's unfortunately a lot of insecurity that goes on in the fitness industry and among these folks because it goes back to that early thing. Mm -hmm. Guys, the kids that were bullied or insecure, they're like, ah, if I get big and muscular, I will be protected from the cold, hard world. Um, there's actually a, a book by, a, I think it was, was it Rich Gaspari? It's called Gorilla Suit. It was by oh, an eighth oh, bodybuilder. Oh. And he actually flat out said, he goes, the reason he got into bodybuilding was he was bullied as a kid and he wanted to build a suit of muscular armor to protect himself from the world. This is Rich Gaspari? Uh, don't swear me to that, but the name of the book is Gorilla Suit. Hang on, I can look it up in the background. And, um, I, you know, so there, there's a lot of guys. Yeah, that's not going to get it. Um, you find that a lot. Bob Paris, sorry. Bob mm -hmm. Paris Gorilla Suit. Uh, My Adventures in Bodybuilding. Um, I think he was also one of the early first bodybuilders to come out. I believe he was gay, but don't swear me to that. So, you know, in, in, he had a lot going on, and he was just like he became a bodybuilder to protect himself from, from all of that. And that's not, it's not uncommon. Not at all. I think it's the story of our lives for many, many people who, yes. who got into, you know, physical fitness. Um, yes. And so what happens is I've had people do this all the time. They'll be like, ah, Lyle, you're awesome, and I want to have you on this and that and the other. And then I'll disagree with something, and suddenly it's, man, you suck, and you're small, and I don't have any respect for you. I'm like, hey, look, why did you want me on your podcast? Why did you friend me on Facebook? Why have you blah, 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 and blown smoke up my ass? Until, and it's just like, man, I love it. I love it when you get in people's faces. Yeah, until it's theirs. Yeah. And then everything changes. So it, it's a lot of different things. And, uh, no doubt, I will take full responsibility. For 20 years, I was a complete asshole online because I could. I could be, and it was fun, and it was just kind of a game, and I enjoyed it. And, you know, Facebook for a while for me was performance art, was to see how many, my goal, I would, I would let people friend me, and then I would basically go see how many people I could get to unfriend me in a given day just by being <laughs> shitty to <them. laughs> Like, you think I'm, I'm not kidding in the least. And it really was performance. Like, I just like to see, I like to push people, I like to push their buttons, I like to see what's going to get them twisted because almost nothing offends me and most things offend other people. So yeah. I just said stuff just, you know, and I wonder why I have no friends. But anyway, um, so yeah, that, that was a big part of my online persona for quite a long time and I've actually, made, for a number of reasons, I'm making a very conscious decision to change that because it was ultimately non-productive. But that, that's going to be around for a while. At the end of the day, I don't care. Um, you know, there's this whole thing that if you spend your life trying to make people like you, you tend to make everybody happy but yourself. Yeah. And the reality is the stuff that I write about, yeah, it's very fact-based. It's very evidence-based. I'm probably one of the people responsible for, for having that 
really pushing that through. You know, I was doing that in the late 90s and on, on some old Usenet groups and a lot of the, you know, there's a lot of guys coming up now that are very evidence-based. Mm -hmm. You know, Martin Birkin was one of them, um, Eric Helms, Lane Norton selectively, Brett Contreras, uh, Brad Schoenfeld, Alan Aragon. Um, I know I've forgotten people. I'm not Those are just people that sort of come. Really, you know, I was sort of the one that, that brought that to light, I think. And, and it's great, but there's still bodybuilding, fitness. There's still a lot of, you know, what's quote unquote called bro science. And there's some validity to some of it. And there's some, a lot of bullshit to yeah, a lot of it. A lot of bullshit. And a lot of it. And that's fine. The reality is a lot of people aren't interested in what I'm selling. And that's fine. I don't worry about them. Hmm. I don't try to convert people. I generally don't argue with people anymore. I will state what I have to state. I will show them the research, and that's pretty much where it starts and stops for me. I learned years ago that you can't change the minds of people who don't want to be changed. There's even the backfire effect that when people have goofy ideas, the more evidence you show them, the harder the more they, they end up sticking with that so idea. It's human psychology, but you know what? Mm -hmm. I just don't care anymore. If I, if they're not my trainee, if they're not hiring me, I have really no emotional investment in it anymore. When they have made, when they've run the gamut of bullshit and they come to me, I'll be more than happy to help. And that's usually, you know, that's kind of the niche for my books is people have done the dieting roller coaster. They've done all the stuff that was crap and stupid and dumb and they're fed up with it. And then they hear about this guy, Lyle McDonald, and the fact that he's actually, his stuff is research-based and honest and true. And, you know, I, I'd love to tell people that it's easy. I'd love to tell people that it's a walk in the park. I'd love to tell people that I'd make more money. If I wrote a book that said, I guarantee you 100% success rates, I'd make way more money. But it's not true. Yeah, um, yeah. The success rates for dieting aren't as bad as people think, but the reality is still that mo more people fail than don't. They fail for a lot of reasons, and I think we touched on a bunch of them, which is they go into it with an approach that's so flawed physiologically, uh, behaviorally, and, and aptly, like they go into it with so many dumb ideas, and so. And I'm not saying they're dumb. I'm saying that the ideas that have been propagated for so long right. that you can lose 30 pounds in a month easily and keep it off with no effort, all this stuff that they've that just become fact by being repeated by people that have no business talking about this or have something to sell. Mm -hmm. They go into it with so many flawed approaches and so many flawed psychological attitudes that they're almost guaranteeing failure. Like they, yeah. it's, it's, and it's it's so unfortunate for the for the consumer. You know what I mean? Because it's like it's just like uh, the, the the people who believe that everything that they hear on the news is absolutely true. It's the same sure. with the New York Times bestsellers list. You know what I yes. mean? <laughs> yeah. um, and 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 it's coming at them from all angles because a guy who's just written a new book about the I don't know the eight hour diet or whatever is yeah, also right. going to be on you know Good Morning America, and then he's also going to be on that other talk show, and because he's got a great publicist and whatever. Yes, and, exactly. You know, all of a sudden, next thing you know everybody believes that this this pile of bullshit that he's propagating is absolutely true and you know half the time it may not be um so that's one of the things again i said it in the beginning of the show and i'll say it again it's what i appreciate about your work is that it's all uh from what at least what i've read is uh research driven you know uh, referenced material it's, it's science-based and that's what i appreciate most about it you know so cool um awesome lyle that's uh, I think that should be it, man. I mean, we're, yeah, I we're at two hours. <laughs> I'm going to end it on the same question that I ask everybody. And uh, yeah. this uh, question is this. What does it mean to you to live a meaningful life? Oh, Lord. Can you not just ask me what kind of tree I want to be? Uh, like, actually, no. You know, and I'll address this in probably from a little bit of a different approach. Sure. An issue I've actually had for a while, for about the last three or four years, is actually having very little meaning in my life. Um, without getting into it, this is on my website. It's something I'm very open about. I was recently diagnosed as um, bipolar 2. Uh, I had an enormous hypomanic phase. This probably contributed to some of my attitude online. Um, the thing about exercise actually came from my counselors, you know, whatever. And my therapist actually talked about, you know, what he called MVP, meaning, value, purpose, which I think is what you're getting at. And that's something that is critically important, I think, for most human, for good psychological health, I think mm -hmm. is what you're getting at is, you know, 
And I know a lot of people have used that to argue for or against religion. And well, if there's no God, you know, whatever, no heaven, you know, how can your life have purpose? And I don't certainly don't agree with that. But for the last three or four years, you know, I kind of realized that a lot of my drive um, in sports and performance and all this came from my own goals. And when I retired from sport, um, and when I was 42, you know, from, from trying to achieve more than I was probably capable of, really, and even in, in 2010, when I finished this crazy speed skating adventure in Utah, like, my life was kind of empty. You know, I, 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 I've, I've managed to create this weird life where most of it's online. I, I tend to be very selective in my friends, so I tend not to have large social groups anymore, and I haven't since college. And my life has kind of become more... Um, constrained and limited over the years between having a very uh, specific set and very limited set of interests, between having a very limited set of friends, you know. Make no mistake, my obsession, my drive, my compulsion is probably is part of why I was probably successful, but everything comes with drawbacks. Um, you know, mm -hmm. most people that are successful in their field are psychotically obsessed, but they miss out on a lot of life. And certainly I missed out on some other interests. So, uh, of, you know, and, and so he brought that up, this meaning, value, purpose, and I really lacked that for a lot of years, and especially the last three or four, which certainly isn't helping my mental status. So since all this happened, you know, I, I really, because Austin has some weird baggage for me and some old bad habits that I need to break, since I've gotten back to Austin after being back in uh, back home, it's something I've actually been actively working on, going, forcing myself, again, the willpower thing, mm -hmm. to do activities to go to social events that I probably wouldn't have in the past because they either held no interest or just what whatever it was, simply so that it becomes a habit so that I get to where I can actually interact with humanity again, not on a computer screen. Um, I've since, you know, I spent several years kind of ignoring my website and not doing a lot of writing and I just kind of wasn't interested and I've, I've, that's come back to me so I am writing again, you know, release this little book and working on a bigger project. Um, sort of, you know, working at home, kind of being, you know, when you're a self-employed writer, you're almost effectively unemployed. And everyone is like, that would be awesome. And it's like, yeah, it's great for about two weeks. It's great to have to not have a schedule and be at home and watch Netflix. But man, then you get bored. And it becomes, the inertia becomes very intense. It's like, well, I don't feel like leaving the house today because I just don't want to. And you just sort of forget, especially for me, it's that perfect storm. Um, so right now I, I'm kind of trying to find again, you know, as I enter the second half of my life, 45, it's like, okay, what am kind of, what am I going to do now when I grow up? What, you know, I don't have a family. I don't want children. I've got my dogs, which I love. Um, I'm not involved in volunteering, although that was really important for me for a couple of years. Finding that right now is one of my current goals. So I don't really have an answer for you at this moment because I don't, you know, I would like to find, I think more balance. For a while, fitness, that industry was really 90% of all that I cared about. And it's still important to me. You know, I'm still going to be meticulous and detail oriented, but it's not the obsession that it once was. Mm -hmm. So I think finding a more balanced life where I have larger groups of friends and go out and I'm social and have some more of that, I think will be a big part of what's meaningful to me. Um, so. I don't know if that really answers your question. No, it absolutely does, and it's one of the more honest answers that I've gotten, so I really appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, I, I, so I don't really have an answer yet. I'm still trying to figure out what that is at this point because, for like I said, for 25 years, all I wanted to do was be good at what I my field and be a better athlete, and now I'm having to find some other things to fill the holes. So maybe the next podcast will have a better answer for you. Absolutely. Thanks. would love to have you back on. Lyle McDonald, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Listen, pick up the book. It's called it's a it's an update, the stubborn fat fat solution patch 1.1, yeah. I think it is. Yes, that is correct. So, and I'll link all this stuff up in the show notes over at meaningfulhq.com. Again, Lyle, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. I know our listeners listeners appreciate it, and we'll hopefully talk to you in another episode in the future. Very good. Have a good one. You too. Thanks, Dean. Bye. Hey, hey, it's Dean Bakari. Thanks so much for tuning in to today's episode of the Meaningful Show podcast. I greatly appreciate it. Listen, if you'd like the show notes for this episode, just click on the information tab over on iTunes or on your Stitcher or whatever app you're listening to this podcast on. 
and click on the link in the information tab. It'll take you straight to the dedicated post page for this specific episode, which is located on MeaningfulHQ.com. Again, that's MeaningfulHQ.com. Thanks again for tuning in, and I'll see you on the next episode.